What's up, guys? It's yo boy Ami Sensei back with a new What If series, Reborn as Thor in High School DXD. Record of Ragnarok XDXD. Part 1. If you enjoy my content, consider subscribing to the channel. Like the video, share, and leave a comment. This really helps with the algorithm. Remember to check out the author of this fantastic fanfic. Link in the description. Also, I have set up a Patreon account, consider joining to support the channel, and for more exclusive content. With all that out of the way, let's get into it. How long has it been? 100 years? 200 years? I stopped counting after 50 years, I think the boredom of counting the seconds, minutes, hours, days got over me. I still have some memories from when I was alive I remember two people, a man, and a woman, I think they were my parents, I remember seeing them every day, it was good, but every time they left. I could hear them starting to cry on the other side of the door, I didn't want them to cry. I remember lying in a bed, I think it was a hospital due to the characteristic smell. I remember spending my time watching movies, mainly Marvel ones, and reading manga. I remember hating one manga in particular. What was the name of that thing again? High school. I suppose it's not important anymore, because one day I closed my eyes, and when I opened them again I was alone sitting on a log at the edge of a lake. It was beautiful very beautiful, it was always night, never I saw the sunrise again, so I could count every star in the sky, it was snowing a little, but the cold for some reason didn't bother me. I didn't want to close my eyes again, I was afraid of losing what I was seeing, so I started counting the time I was there, until boredom overcame me and I stopped counting, and I just kept enjoying the view. Times passed something different happens. It's very beautiful isn't it? said a voice beside me. Yes, I said calmly the voice sounded welcoming, like I didn't need to panic. I looked and saw a familiar face, which was in every Marvel movie I watched lying in that bed Stanley. I asked confused. Hum not exactly, he said with a small smile until he sat down on the same log I was sitting on. Tell me, son what would you do if you had the opportunity to see the sun one more time? What? I asked confused. Don't know if you're new here old Stan, but here it's night forever, something interesting appears in the sky, sometimes like a meteor shower, or the northern lights suddenly appear, or even a damn planet gets close enough to see it without needing a fucking telescope, but one thing never changes, it's always night. I told Stan Lee's copy. Well it's what you choose after all. He said without sounding offended. What did you say? I was confused, what did he mean by that? Tell me, son, I know it's hard because it's night, but don't you think this place is kind of familiar? He asked with a small smile. I looked at it, and then I noticed the place better the trees, the lake, and further away I could see some abandoned houses. My memory isn't the best, it never was, but I've seen this before. I've already been here I said looking at Stan, who seemed to agree. In fact this is a small town in Norway known to you as Ada yes, you've been here before with your parents, when your life was more than lying in a hospital bed watching movies or a nime, and reading manga, said the copy of Stan looking at the lake. When you were still smiling at your parents and when they smiled back, they gave you a real smile, not the fake one they gave you when you were in that hospital. Why am I here? I asked. I already said what would you do if you had the opportunity to see the sun one more time, was my question to you, and I was still waiting for the answer, he said looking at me. I started thinking about the answer what did I want? Money? Girls? Power? But when we reach the end of our life, what does it all matter? When we die none of this will accompany us I don't know I replied not knowing what to say. Good answer, he said smiling. If you want to make fun of me then go away, I said to him, and I started to look at the lake. Stanley started laughing before answering, I don't mock her. What you said was a really good answer for me. You see, I'm tired of hearing absurd things humans say to me, like, I would live without regrets, but the truth is, people always regret their mistakes. They think they made mistakes at some point in the past, and they forget the gift that is the present, they can plan for their future, but the future remains uncertain. What I mean is, you are the first one to give me this answer do you know why? He asked looking at me. 
because I was never asked what I would do if I had a second chance? I asked, with a slight tone of sarcasm, raising an eyebrow. He laughed again, am I a comedian now? Ha 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 no, let me tell you, something son, you only have one life, it may seem short, but if you live right then one life is enough. You gave me that answer, it wasn't because no one ever asked you that it was because you've already lived without regrets, you may have died young. But the sensations, the feelings, the happiness you felt when you were alive, they were the best things you've ever felt and will ever feel. That's why you didn't give me an answer like the others you already have no regrets he explained, smiling at me. So what? It's true I have no regrets, but what happens to me now? I asked uncertainly, looking at the old man. How special you are you choose, said Stanley getting up and walking towards the lake which now had two doors on the edge, what the hell? That wasn't there before, I said pointing to the doors. Stanley smiled and said. It wasn't meant to be there what's that supposed to mean? I asked, what's up with old men and their riddles? That's what it is, I said I would let you choose well, here's your choice, the door to my right will lead you to a room where you will be surveyed about your life, and will decide if you will go to heaven or hell, in the end, it comes down to eternal rest, don't worry, I've seen your life, it's certain you'll go to heaven and no, you won't find your grandfather or grandmother, in fact. Not even they met after all, everyone has their unique heaven and, for them, perfect. The door to my left, however let's just say it won't be a rest for you at all you will live again, but in the universe of my choice, but I will choose only between what you have watched or read. It will be fun, I guarantee that. Stanley spoke introducing the doors and what's on the other side. So can I be reincarnated in the Shakijeki no Sama universe or the fucking Marvel universe? I asked to be sure. Well it's like you humans sometimes say. Shit can go from zero to a hundred real fucking quick, due to the number of movies, and I'm, and manga you've seen, the odds are one one thousand for each universe you've already known he said, smiling. Hum, I thought. That was probably the biggest choice of my life on the one hand, I would have my eternal rest, I would probably be bored with the perfection of my heaven at some point, on the other hand, I could fall into a world of adventure and never get bored. But it could be dangerous like the fucking Marvel Universe being threatened by a genocidal purple Homer Simpson steroid-soaked psychopath, or it could be a peaceful universe like Shakijeki no Sama, where the worst thing that could happen to me is the loss of my clothes due to food that seems to throw golden glitter during preparation to make it shiny. Well you know what they say when you don't know where to go, you sometimes need to leap of faith into the unknown I said, walking to the door that was on Stan's left. Once you open the door, there's no turning back warned Stanley. I grabbed the doorknob and opened it, for a moment it was all shiny, several images from all the universes of movies, comics, manga, and I'm I've seen. Until stopped at one and heard a word. A word that made me remember the hatred for an anime that I only watched the first season. Apai shouted a red armor that resembled a dragon. No I tried to close the door, but I didn't seem to have the strength to move the door so I ran. No I refuse I screamed running as if my life depended on it it does. Until I was forced through the door, I felt like I was being sucked into a black hole. Aaahhh help me you said it would be fun. I yelled towards Stanley, who looked calm with a smile on his face. Don't act like it's the end of the world besides, I never said it would be fun for you he said smiling. Motherfuck I couldn't finish until I was pulled to the door and closed the door. POV. Third person, location limbo? Hum I think he will need a little help, but the rest will depend on him, said the copy of Stan Lee. He pointed a hand and fired lightning towards the door that pulled the young man by force. Well my work here is done I hope he can fill the void you left behind old friend he spoke sadly, and disappeared from the place. POV, MCI. Damn you copy of Stan Lee I yelled through my fall, towards the pile of shit that was the DXD universe. Honestly. I would prefer to be reborn in any other universe I had seen, unfortunately, I didn't completely watch High School DxD, I only watched the first season, and due to not liking it, I ended up forgetting some things. So I just remember the basics like. Sacred Gears. Satoshi Ash Ketchum adult in teenage clothes treating familiars like Pokemon. Faction Supernatural Politics. Flaming Chickens aka Phoenix. Breasts powered protagonist with sacred gear capable of killing a god. 
powerful characters capable of snapping their fingers like Thanos without needing the infinite gem equals completely unbalanced characters. Conclusion I'm fucked. I didn't like the Anime for several reasons, how ridiculous, it was one of them after all, the protagonist's first words made me a little afraid, I still remember the words that idiot spoke for the first time. Ah. I want to squeeze some boobs how easy he was to be manipulated wasn't very surprising, who the hell would accept being the boyfriend of someone he's never met or even had contact with, and who claimed she watched him from afar, any sane person would call her a stalker or a mentally unbalanced person, but what did the protagonist do? He accepted the invitation because she had big tits. I'm rambling again, where was I? Oh, right I was falling. Aya, I screamed again. A noise behind me caught my attention, I turned and saw lightning coming towards me. Did the old man change his mind? I said, with a tone of hope, get me out of this shithole old man. I said, opening my arms waiting for the lightning to hit me and take me anywhere, I was ready to embrace my destruction. When lightning was about to hit me, I closed my eyes and waited. I waited and waited and I kept waiting what the hell I said, opening my eyes I saw that I was still falling into this weird tunnel. What the fuck? Why am I feeling like a Hogwarts letter you know what, fuck it I thought looking at a small letter in front of me, I picked it up and opened it, the letter jumped out of my hand, and started to fold into something like a mouth. Greetings again my son. Due to the answers, you gave me, and the entertainment you will provide me. I'll help you one last time regarding your reincarnation, the character I chose for you to reincarnate was. The God of Thunder Thor from a different universe of course a little tip. Train as if your life depended on it because it does, while you will be reincarnated as a god you will not be invincible, it will depend on you becoming strong. Your last gift will be given to you when you are ready to hold it, keep an eye out for a red star. Spoke the letter. So I will reincarnate as a god shit, the old man is forcing me to participate in the supernatural, and I was wanting to be reborn as a mere mortal without sacred gear, and live far away from Japan, Canada would be my first choice. My train of thought was interrupted by the letter that continued to talk. P.S. If you're strong enough you'll have a true form when you get your gift from the Red Star. We never introduce ourselves, let me tell you who I am, as this is the last time you will receive messages from me. While saying my name is impossible in the language of any reality, I will refer to myself as the one who is above all. Good luck. And enjoy your new life. Stanley's Chai be waving, the one who is above all. One above all the one above all holy shy, I started screaming until interrupted by a flash of light. POV frig. I was waiting for my perverted husband to return from his meeting with the leaders of the pantheons, he brought disturbing news last time the leader of the Greek pantheon Uranus was murdered by his own youngest son Kronos, I'm afraid of what might happen to my friend Ray, as she was forced to marry that monster. The old laws prevented me from helping her directly, as no pantheon should interfere in the affairs of another pantheon, I honestly think this law absurd, but I can't do anything since Amon Ra and Shiva themselves established this law, I can even visit other pantheons, but I can't help them in case of problems. I hear the door open, and I turn to look at my husband Aden who has just arrived, he is holding a baby, I can't believe you did it again to me Aden, I yelled addressing him. My love. Please wait. Said Aden nervously. I didn't wait for an explanation and started hitting him after all, another child outside of our marriage? He already had Vider and Vali with two giants, and they're not even two years old. Out his other son, with a mortal, Hermod who is only one year. Frig ouch. Please ouch. Let me explain. Aden tried to say. I stopped but still had my hand up. What's your excuse? I yelled. You see I had returned from meeting with the leaders of the other pantheons, as well as the new leader of the Greeks I went towards the temple of Georgian, seeking clarity on my thoughts, until lightning struck the altar, and then I saw that a small cocoon made of crystal, appeared in the place that the lightning hit the altar, when I got closer I noticed this child inside the cocoon. As soon as I touched the cocoon it started to glow and soon fell apart, the baby has been sleeping since I took it out of the temple, you can see how different he is with those golden veins that protrude from his skin. Said Aden pointed to the child. I looked and noticed that he was right, there were some kinds of veins in the child's body, there were few, but I've never seen anything like that, 
but I noticed that he had a little of my husband's power, was it the cocoon that assimilated his power? Anyway, he has some of your divine power so he's still your son, I said with finality, looking at the child in Aden's arms. Yes, said Aden. I'll give him his name, I said taking the baby from Aden's arms. But Aden started to speak, but I soon cut him off. I will give his name. I said again facing Aden. Yes, ma'am, said Aden. I looked at the child sleeping in my arms, I can feel he will be different, call it maternal instincts or whatever he will do the impossible. After a while, I decided on his name. You will be Thor I said smiling at the child, who started to wake up. A pair of golden eyes with black sclera stares at me curiously, at first glance they looked intimidating, but it has its own beauty. Hello, little one I'm your mother Frigg I said smiling. The baby said nothing and continued to stare at me. Hello my son. Said Aden, approaching the child and coming into his line of sight. I'm your father Aden. And I promise to teach you the secrets of life when you're older. By starting with women's breasts. Said Aden with one of his perverted smiles looking at the child. My husband's smile got a reaction from the child Buea. Cried little Thor, as he swung his little arms and legs. See what you've done. I said to Aden, as I tried to calm down Thor. What did I do? Questioned Aden in disbelief. You scared him with those stupid smiles. Get out of here, you've done enough. I replied. Yes ma'am said Aden leaving the room with his head down. POVMC Thor, I will start referring to the MC as Thor from now on, after the flash of light, I blacked out. Just started to wake up due to the voices, I opened my eyes and saw the face of a very beautiful woman. Hello, little one I'm your mother Frigg she said smiling. Frigg? I wasn't very studious about mythology when I was alive, but in the Marvel movies, it was Thor's mother's name, right? Now, where's the All-Father? My father, the one who sacrificed an eye for knowledge. The wisest of all Norse gods hello my son. Said an old man's voice. It's him. It can only be him. I looked toward the voice and saw an elderly man with long, gray hair, and a matching beard. He wears a gold and white monocle over his left eye, without the addition of the chain. There is no doubt. Present to me your vast wisdom father. I'm your father Aden. And I promise to teach you the secrets of life when you're older. He started to say. What wise words. I can't wait for what will teach me starting with women's breasts. Finished saying with a smile. The fuck? Wait this smile I've seen this smile before in the fucking protagonist. Does that mean dot 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 no Stanley you must be laughing now aren't you bastard? That's when I realized that perverted Aden was still smiling at me. Wipe that smile off your face perverted bastard. Get the hell out of my face. I thought. It was then that reality fell I will live and fight for this man I will put up with his perverted and childish comments for the rest of my life as a Norse god. I did the most mature thing possible anyone would do in my situation. I cried. Buea, POV Aden. As I left Frigg's room I couldn't help but return my thoughts to the boy he was different, an anomaly, but still I could feel that he would be needed for what was to come, I turned to the Valkyria that was standing guard in front of the door, from the size and shape of her breasts, I could tell it was Brunhild, even with her helmet covering her face. Brunhild contact your sisters, ask them to gather the Aesir and Vanner gods in the throne room, and when you stop hearing the cry of the child inside the room, let my wife know to meet there too I commanded, it was time to report the events. As you ordain father of all Brunhild replied, raising her hand and forming a rune. Without waiting, I started walking towards the throne room. Kai looked towards the noise and saw my crows, Hugin and Munin, flying towards me, apparently finished their task sooner than expected. They soon landed on my shoulders. Hugin, Munin, report I ordered hurriedly, at last the missions assigned to them were of the utmost importance, and they left every two days to carry out the missions, and only returned after seven days. Ka Surge remains in Muspelheim Ka has not yet shown any interest in leaving the throne Ka Hugin, the Black Raven, replied. Nothing has changed Ha even after centuries he still sits on that throne waiting I wish Lidskiev could allow me to see the other realms, and not be limited to places that have no connection with the divine, then I looked at Munin the White Crow. Ka Gleipnir proves tougher than the previous two chains Ka the dwarves have lived up to their word, 
Fenrir doesn't seem to be able to break free without help Khan no one has come to visit him, neither Turn nor Loki, said Munin. Good, I replied, as I continued to walk. Honestly, if it were up to me that beast wouldn't even breathe, but even Gunnar wasn't able to hurt him. The skin was very tough, and its fangs and claws are capable of hurting a god, the ability to kill a god indeed, the title murderer of god suits him, especially after he managed to break Dromi, and kill the god Mimir, with a single bite in an excess of rage, if Tur hadn't calmed him down, there would probably be more victims. I may be unable to kill him, but I won't let that thing know the feeling of freedom. POV Frigg. After I managed to calm little Thor down and put him to sleep, I heard someone knock on the bedroom door. You can come in, I said. The door opened and I saw it was Brunhild. My lady, Lord Odin, has called a meeting between the gods Esir and Vanner in the throne room, he requires your presence as well, Brunhild said, bowing her head. It was time ha, huh? I see Brunhild do me a favor? Keep an eye on the kid, he's just gone to bed, so I don't think he'll wake up anytime soon, I said. Certainly my queen, at your command, replied Brunhild, raising her right hand to her chest. Relax more Brunhild, it doesn't have to be so formal after all I took care of you when you were just a little girl, I said with a small smile. Dot 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 mistress it's inappropriate, Brunhild replied, looking in any direction but my eyes. Even though I couldn't see her face, I knew she was blushing how cute. I started laughing. A mother, sometimes, must shame her children when she has the opportunity after all, when a mother sees her children grown up, proud of their achievements, it does well to remind them of the age of shame. Ha 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 ha. Anyway Brunhild, I'll leave now, thanks for taking care of little Thor I said, heading for the door. I opened the door, but before leaving I looked at Brunhild again. Brunda take good care of your new little brother, I said with a smile and winked at her, and I closed the door. Third person POV. In Odin's throne room, several gods Vanner and Esir were present, all eagerly awaiting the pronouncement of Odin, who sat on his throne Lidskiev. Now that everyone is here I'll talk about the last meeting between the Pantheon said Odin, but was soon cut off by someone. Brother. I don't think any information about such a gathering that takes place every century is important to Asgard, we should focus on our realm, like the increasing disappearance of Huldras, said a god, that god was Loki, the foster brother of Odin, adopted by Bor. How dare you interrupt your king? Also, do you have the audacity to say what is better for the kingdom than the king himself? Even being the king's brother, I will not tolerate such insolence. Shouted a god who had only one hand, that god was Tur, the one who holds the title of the bravest among the Norse gods. Before a fight could break out a voice resounded in the room, it was a low voice, but the tone was one of authority. Silence everyone turned towards the voice and saw Odin staring at them. Those were not the eyes of a man who was recognized for his perversion, those eyes were of a god who became a king through bloodshed and cruelty, those eyes asked, no demanded respect. I will not tolerate conflicts between us. While the other pantheons are getting stronger every day and the so-called true god creates more soldiers, building his own army that one day will be able to challenge other pantheons in numbers. We've already shown weakness to other pantheons by not being able to arrest a being capable of killing a god, twice. Said Odin with a frown. Loki immediately tried to answer. My son. Your son, managed to kill an ancient god, even though he was only a few years old, mutilated Tur and it was prophesied that the very existence of the animal, marks the beginning of Surt's awakening, the scourge of Asgard. Said Odin, quickly cut Loki off, and looked directly at him silencing him once more. As everyone knows, the meeting between the leaders of the pantheons was formed, due to the growing movement of the self-proclaimed true god, with the creation of soldiers and weapons that function as our divine artifacts. This was the third time that the leaders of the pantheons met however, between the last meeting, and the one that took place recently, there were certain events. The main one was the murder of the leader of the Greek pantheon by his own son, Kronos, and after the last meeting, I can say that Uranus, however much he had children with his own mother and locked some in the depths of Tartarus out of fear, was more receptive than the current leader, if I could sum up the current leader of the Greeks in two words, they would be. Recluse and unpredictable, said Odin, sighing at the end. My lord, what does this mean? Asked Njord, the current leader of the Vanner gods and father of Free and Freja. 
As everyone knows, when Fenrir broke through loading with no difficulty, even though it was made from the best metals, it was clear that it would not be easy to get a material that was strong enough in our realm. So it was determined that some gods would set out on a quest for stronger divine materials, to forge a new chain for Fenrir, my wife Frigg risked a trip to the Greek pantheon in search of a different metal, which became famous in the Aegean, the celestial bronze, initially Uranus did not allow. But Frigg remained in Greece, by the right of the guest, trying to convince him, in the short time she remained, she managed to establish a relationship with one of Uranus's daughters, that relationship made Uranus yield to Frigg's request, and he handed her some divine bronze ingots, when Frigg returned with the ingots, we forged Dromi. Odin explained. My king, I don't understand. How does this help with your opinion of the new leader? Asked Scotty, Jord's wife. Uranus cares for some of his children, Ray is one of them however, the new leader doesn't seem to care about the guests' rights or care about his brothers and sisters. What I find disturbing is that he was able to kill Uranus quickly, even though his existence is not that long, which could mean that there is more to this story. We only got to know of Uranus's death because Ray managed to contact me shortly after her father's death, while Frigg was returning from her journey from the Dwarf's Forge with the Svalon shield in hand, if not for that. He would have me surprised during the leader's meeting with the change of government to Temrar Shiva said something. Asked Frigg. No, said Odin, shaking his head in denial. But why? Asked Frigg in disbelief. We don't interfere in the problems of other pantheons. That's one of the only laws, even if there is patricide involved, it's not for us to question the government of any pantheon, Odin said firmly. Frigg didn't look pleased with the answer, but she stayed silent. Odin then started talking again. Now, there's something else that needs to be discussed during my return, I headed towards the temple of Georgian POV Thor. I woke up after a while, for a moment I hoped everything was a dream, when I woke up in a cradle made of gold, and like anything was bigger than my hand, and mainly my inability to get up, I realized that my dream had turned into a nightmare in real life oh shit. I couldn't help but return my thoughts to my new life, and how dangerous it could become, but before I started to reflect on my future actions, I felt like I was being stared at by someone. I looked towards the presence and I saw a being that was staring at me like I was a time bomb, by the helmet with wings on the sides, I assumed it was one of the Valkyries of Legends. But the thing is, why the hell is she staring at me like that? What are you looking at? Never seen a baby god before? While it's what I'd like to say what came out was something humiliating. Gah. Ugh. I babbled. Did it come out of my mouth? Oh, man oh. Does the young prince wish to get out of the cradle? said the Valkyria, coming towards me. She picked me up and placed me in her arms. Not. Let me go. I didn't ask for any of that. I screamed, but again gah. Hum he must miss Mrs. Frigg don't worry my prince, I'm sure your mother will return soon, said the Valkyria looking at me in her arms, and then she started to rock me. I don't blame her, I think she was trying to calm me down. But the problem is she was shaking me too fast. Frigor should I call her mother? Whatever. Mom. If I were mortal, this Valkyrie would have already broken my neck just swinging like that. But then I remembered I was a damn baby. And what does a baby do until he gets what he wants? Gah that's right he cries. The Valkyrie looks surprised. My threat seems to have had an effect, as it soon stopped shaking me success. She soon put me in the crib as if I were made of glass, but stayed close to the crib, I think she was worried if something happened. Thank you. Now the most important mission name. Survival Guide. The name is quite explanatory actually. After all the DXD universe is a double-edged sword, so I must lay down some rules. First anything can potentially kill you so if you have the first opportunity to get rid of a problem, do it. That's the first rule unfortunately, as I only watched the first season I'm unable to know what will be a problem. A good example is that I knew the flaming chicken would be a problem. For the protagonist, not for me. The less involved in the supernatural school drama, the better. However in the first season, I remember that the Gremory girl spoke of a great war I wanted to believe that this would only involve the three biblical factions, but I think it's kind of unlikely that the pantheons would remain in silence at this time Cold War, maybe? Pantheons supporting biblical factions that had the same interests? 
It's a possibility. Now that I've stopped to think I don't even know what part of human history I was currently, but if I'm the Norse god Thor and I'm a baby who can't even wipe his ass, literally, then shit I'm way off the first episode, aren't I? As much as it means that my current knowledge of the Anime is useless, it opens up new possibilities. But I can't exaggerate with it, or it will be like the flashpoint effects of my favorite DC Comics hero Flash. If I change the past too much I'll fuck the future although didn't I already fuck the future when I came to exist in this world. Damn, there's no way to know. I can't think about it right now after all, because I can't do anything, but if it means a new timeline, rule number two will be extremely important. This brings me to the next rule. Second be powerful as fuck. Reason? The explanation is pretty basic actually, in this world if you are strong you live longer, if you are weak you live less. So simple but so true in this universe. My ways to be powerful? In my physical training, I could imitate Satama's training to increase the results I should multiply the regimen a hundred times, after all I'm a god, I must have infinite resistance. I think. Probably dot 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 I have no idea. But if that's not the case, then I must look for a way to at least extend that resistance. How can I do that, though? It's simple. This brings me to the next point. Magic. How can I increase physical limits with magic? I will need two things. Knowledge in magic, more specifically in runes, and knowledge in forging. When do I put these two together? Unlimited power as long as I have a good imagination, of course, the challenge is how am I going to acquire this kind of knowledge? If it's magic maybe I can learn from Frigg I suppose, but Forge? One of the little things I know about Norse mythology is. The best blacksmiths are dwarves. But I'm not sure they'd be willing to teach me in exchange perhaps? Knowledge for knowledge? Arg, I can't think of a solution right now so I'm going to move on to the next rule. Third have a pet. I'm ashamed to admit it, but I miss my dog from my previous life, I can't remember his name as well as my parents' names, but I do remember taking him off the streets on the last trip that I went to Norway with my parents, I remember we were going to visit my grandfather, I found the dog in Ada, and brought him to my house in Rome? Hum. My mother was Italian, my father was Norwegian right? Ah. I'm digressing anyway. A pet would help me in many ways in addition to taking me out of the boredom of loneliness, when I was alone for rule number 4 fourth be a badass. It sounds childish but these are the words that most come down to how I should act. The reason? Nobody messes with the badass and therefore. Less likely to be dragged by someone to fight petty confrontations, in addition to the possibility of making references to the amazing works of my time. Moving on to rule number 5, which is also very important. 5th Shameless Plagiarism. It is a fact that Thor is renowned for his incredible prowess in combat with his divine hammer, the Mjolnir, but I don't want to be Thor the god of hammers. To solve this problem I will need to go further than channeling my elemental divine energy into Mjolnir, because I am the god of thunder, I should probably have some innate control over the lightning element in short I can shape it. Theoretically of course I'm just a baby at the moment, and I can't prove my point, but if this is real. Then Jutsus Raiden, Goro Goro no Mi techniques, Thunder Breath technique, and several other techniques from anime and movies, can be replicated by me to some extent if not completely. It will all depend on my control and practice. While I would like to continue my survival guide I felt a disturbance in my gut no, it can't be Valkyria. Help me. Gah. My prince. What do you need? Asked the Valkyrie hurriedly questioned, and placed me in her arms. But I couldn't speak not in my current self, I could only close my eyes and accept my fate sniff sniff ugh, I think I know what the young prince needs, said the Valkyria with one hand on her nose. Just shut up and change me time skip. 10 years. POV Thor. It's been 10 years since I've been in this world, I've learned that the Norse gods age like humans, until they completely stop aging once they reach their physical prime for a few millennia, and to stay on that peak. It is necessary to eat one of the apples of the Vanner goddess of youth Eden, at least once every thousand years. This I learned from Frigg, someone I've come to consider my new mother, I won't forget my mother from my past life I'll miss her it's true, after all I grew up believing that we only had one life, and therefore one mother for a short time, I thought that I would be alone. 
But Frigg gave me someone to call mom, she was just like my old mother, kind and caring, but strict when necessary, most of the time it was no surprise that I accepted calling her mama as my first word. I didn't call out in my father though, I called him an old man when I was able to speak properly, I refuse to respect a man who only takes it seriously when the situation calls for it. Besides, he shattered every image I had about the wisest Norse god. One thing I found out was which Thor I was reborn it was Thor of record of Ragnarok, and of all Thors that was the one I had the least knowledge of, the only thing I knew about him, was that he was portrayed as a battle maniac and merciless to his opponents. However, I had one thing in common with him, we both got bored very easily. Another thing I learned was that there's a good reason humans can't remember their first few months of life, the humiliation level is over 9000. Unable to speak, other than Bubigaga unable to go to the bathroom, my own gut betrays me. Unable to feed, my food? Breast milk a woman's tits milk. Unable to sit, I have no strength. And that's just the first few months. I started training as soon as I managed to stand up one day only for Aden to talk to me the next day about my recklessness, and that I would train when I was older, I was more surprised by the fact that he discovered my training, he's thrown Litskiev can see almost everything in the universe. Including the things that would make the great Sanandreya proud, what did I do after the conversation? I shamelessly ignored the conversation I had with Aden, and the next day I was training again, I didn't care about the opinion of Odin or Frigg or anyone else, I must be stronger, the sooner the better I am not the one who has the power of protagonism in this universe. Both Odin and Frigg tried to stop me, but when they realized it wouldn't do any good, they fell silent and started to motivate me. Now, at age 10, I'm standing in front of my old man Odin in the throne room, while he's talking to Loki I couldn't help but shudder, Loki from Marvel is much friendlier than this one. Thor. It's rare for you to come here, you're usually training at the boot camp needs something? Maybe a nice woman with big tits? Humbrunhold should be available, asked Odin with a small smile on his face wagging his eyebrows. Idiot old man I couldn't help but notice that my uncle made a face of disgust, but the vibes weren't. What a degenerate man, rather. What an idiot leader. Do I smell a usurper? I was quiet, with my poker face, before speaking. Old man I'd like to learn how to forge I said, with a small smile. POV Thor. Learn to forge? My nephew only dwarves, and their descendants, are assigned to the forges. We are as guardians, we don't forge our weapons, we let the dwarves forge for us, said my uncle Loki. And there was the thought of superiority foolish uncle, you have to think outside the box. Thanks to my mother Frigg, affectionately nicknamed. The Encyclopedia. I realized something we cannot depend on the dwarves to forge our weapons forever. What if they decided to go back to Midgard Underground, called Nadavalar, and abandon us? They just haven't come back so far because they're afraid of being invaded by the Jotun led by Utgard, because I found out from my mother what an idiot the Jotun race is, I wouldn't be surprised if they broke the peace and rebelled against the kingdoms, this will cause Asgard to go to war once more, and if Asgard wins the war? Odin is not recognized as a benevolent god in the books. The Jotun have only been alive so far, as Odin's father, my grandfather Bor, made peace by marrying a Jotun, who would become Odin's mother, my grandmother Bestla, but if the Jotun break the peace? I do not doubt that my old man will retaliate, whether his mother is a Jotun or not. If that happens the dwarves no longer need to stay in Asgard, I must take advantage while they are here to learn from the best blacksmiths. Hum could you explain to me why you want to learn how to forge my son? Asked Odin curiously. I wish to expand my abilities I replied. It wasn't a lie, but it wasn't the whole truth either, after all, I had some rather crazy ideas when combining magic runes with the dwarf forge, the first idea that came to my mind. Living armor. Or something close why not? I knew there was already a living sword, the famous Dane's Leaf. A cursed sword made by a dwarf named Dane who dared to mix runes with Forge, was said that the one who unsheathes it, must kill a man to have its scabbard returned, otherwise it will devour some of the user's life force. Thank you Frigg Encyclopedia. Due to the emergence of such a curse, it was decided as common sense to no longer mix magic with Forge, but I will not follow such common sense. 
I suspect that the Dwarf Dane was too quick to make a legendary weapon that was on par with Odin's spear, as it was Odin himself who made the runes for his spear, so Dane must have missed the runes during the forge, and that resulted in the curse on the sword dwarves were recognized for their talent in forging, not magic runes. I won't make the same mistake. So I will study runes magic and forge rigorously, and I had already started runes with my mother, it was time to learn how to forge. As long as I think you're more of a warrior than a blacksmith, I don't think denying your wish is a good thing, as I feel you'll ignore it again if I deny your request, said Odin, with a sly smile. I will not deny the truth of these words. So I'll support you Odin started to say, but I soon cut him off. Thank you, old man. I replied hastily, already leaving the room. But you must convince the blacksmith who will teach you, and don't even try to use your prince status, the dwarves don't care about that, continued Odin. Okay this might complicate things a bit. Right old man I replied, not so confident. And then I left the throne room. Third person POV, throne room, don't you think you're spoiling him a little? You're giving in to everything he asks for, Loki said as he crossed his arms, with an accusatory tone with a small smile on his face. Hahaha may be your right brother, but if he wants to stay strong in every way, and if it benefits Asgard by all means, I'll spoil him as much as possible. He is one of the princes of Asgard, and as my beautiful Frigg is finally pregnant after centuries with my first child with her, I will support him so that in the future, he supports his little brother who will be the future king. Just like you support me brother replied Odin. Loki didn't say anything, but he still had a smile on his face. If our meeting is already over, I will retire to my room, I would like to see how my beloved Frigg is doing, said Odin. Certainly brother, I would be a fool to keep you from meeting your beautiful wife, said Loki, with a playful smile. Thank you Loki, we'll see you in the next meeting, said Odin, already walking towards the exit. As Odin left the throne room, he didn't see that the god Loki had lost the smile on his face, and his gaze had turned to an icy one. POV Thor. I soon headed to the forge of Asgard, and into the building. The first thing I noticed about the people working on it, was that its main occupants didn't even notice my arrival, or didn't care, they were all focused on their respective projects. So these are the dwarfs? Now how to convince one of them to teach me how to forge? I soon approached the closest dwarf. Um hey, can I have a minute of your Tim dot, shut up brat. Can't you see I'm busy? Go find something to do shouted the dwarf. He doesn't even look at me, but what a rude little bearded Yoda I frowned, but then addressed another dwarf note to self all dwarfs are rude. I tried to talk to any dwarf, but I was always greeted with rude words, I had given up and was now sitting on a table the reason? If a dwarf answers me rudely again, I would explode I think I'm having anger issues right now. So I decided to wait for some dwarf to finish or take a break from their work, so I can have a civil conversation I guess. It was my best option after all, so I decided to wait until an opportunity presented itself. Until I heard something behind me. Get your ass off my workbench, kiddo, said a voice. I turned and saw a woman who didn't look like a dwarf at all, how do I know that? She was taller. What? I asked confused. I said, get your fucking ass off my workbench. Screamed the woman. I soon got off the table. As soon as I left, she placed a heavy looking bag where I was sitting, and then opened it I could see several tools, I recognized some by their appearance, but others I had no idea of their purpose. What the fuck are you looking at, kid? Asked the woman. Oh. I got caught snooping ah I was just curious that's all I tried to explain myself. Curious? Hum are you a god, right? I can feel your divine energy what are you doing here? Got lost from your mother's tits? Asked the woman with a mocking smile on her face. For a brief moment. I thought about answering. Yes, I'm looking for another woman's tits right now, but yours won't do, they're too droopy, it was tempting very tempting but she was the first person on this pile of shit called a forge to talk to me for more than 10 seconds. I think my previous attempts to talk to the dwarves resulted in my repressed anger of mine I sighed. So I don't like to stall because I don't want to waste my time. I came here for training, he said with finality. Training? Does a god want to learn how to forge? The woman asked in disbelief. Ha 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 ha. 
The woman just started laughing I remained impassive. I think I just wasted my time POV Thor. Now that you've finished considering what I said is a bad joke. Can we talk about business? I asked the woman impassively. Business? Aren't you too young to understand that word? You look like has the same age as my daughter Sif. I bet you haven't even tasted a woman's pussy, so don't talk about things you have no idea about, the woman scoffed. This woman I've never seen a woman so vulgar and so insufferable. On second thought, I've seen it, but the Queen of Thorns is on another level. Look you don't like me, I understand the feeling is mutual, don't worry. But I came here for one purpose, and that is to learn how to forge from a dwarf. You, as much as you don't look like a dwarf, are in the dwarf's forge, and no one has come to question what you are doing here, which leads me to believe that. Or you've earned the dwarf's respect, which I think is unlikely due to my recent contact with the dwarves of this forge or are you descended from a dwarf, he said with a tone of finality. Oh. Congratulations. Mystery solved. Said the woman, who started clapping her hands, want me to make you a medal. I'll even carve on it. Captain Obvious on the back, she said sarcastically. Ugh. Calm down Thor remember you need a teacher go to your happy spot and count from 1 to 10. I sighed. I was serious about wanting to do business with you, I want to learn the forge but no one had the decency to talk to me, so what can I do for you to teach me? The woman kept looking at me it looks like she's finally going to take me seriously. Huff you're a persistent brat, I admit that. You are as stubborn as my daughter and as stubborn as I was the woman reflected. Am I witnessing a change in the character's personality? As you pointed out I'm the daughter of a dwarf my mother died in childbirth my father was devastated for quite a while and he spent that time raising me. When I was old enough he wanted to give me his teachings and the rest of my childhood I spent learning to be a blacksmith my father passed away a few decades ago. His body was already weak, he was sick, that's why he gave me his teachings, said the woman with a faraway look. I feel like I shouldn't interrupt so I was silent. Soon the woman seemed awake from her thoughts and looked at me again after some consideration. She opened her bag and took out a piece of leather with something written on it. All right now. Let's make a deal. I'm in the middle of a project and I have two items missing to complete it. The problem is that these items are missing at the moment and I don't want to pay for it for some search party to a non-dangerous quest. Bring me these two items and I'll teach you a thing or two, and I'll owe you a favor," said the woman, handing me the piece of leather. Yes. I said. I may have turned into a mere item hunter, but at least she'll teach me. I looked at what was noted on the piece of leather. Hmm? The tendons of a bear? I said in confusion. But the second item that's what ripped out the rest of my sanity. How the hell am I going to be able to collect a fish's breath? I questioned looking at the blacksmith woman in disbelief. How do you think we make weapons capable of harming a god? With some cheap metal? No kid I'll give you, your first advice to be a blacksmith make the impossible possible, me and the other dwarfs live by that code, said the woman. Still these items are ridiculous, is it really possible to forge them? The woman seems to have noticed my doubt as she raised an eyebrow. If you think it's a joke, it's not. These are the items I need, if you can't do such a task. Go look for something else to learn from someone else. You can start by learning how to satisfy a woman, she said mockingly at the end. No, I accept the quest, I said. Good, so it's a deal then? Asked the woman. Yes, I never introduced myself. I'm Thor, I said, holding out my right hand for her to shake. She looked at my hand for a while before spitting into her right hand before shaking my hand. I'm at Huna, nice to meet you boys, said the woman, now called it Huna, with a smile. Time skip. 90 years, Thor. 100 years old, POV Thor. And so I continued my life as an immortal god, for 90 years I studied runes with my mother Frigg, and learned to forge from Edhuna. Also, I continued to train my body every day in the training camps, I didn't stop for a single day, my magical manipulation with my main element, which was lightning, proved to be easy, compared to others training. I was able to copy most of the lightning element techniques I've seen in Anime, a good example? One of the techniques I wanted in my arsenal was from the Naruto universe. The Rate no Yorai of the Third Drakage. Of course, I didn't use Chakra, but my divine power was a great substitute because it was more potent. 
Most of the techniques I didn't take more than 7 days to master, this was due to my affinity with the lightning element the technique that lasted 7 days. The ability to concentrate my divine power of lightning nature in a single point, to be able to explode and stop time, just like Zeus from Record of Ragnarok, if he stole the move from his own father, I can steal from him too. It's not your move it's our move. The reason I wanted to recreate this move? To give it a glorious name. Besides being very useful what's the move name? Haha, <laughs> I already had the perfect name from day one of training trying to recreate it. It's not. The world it's. Sawa Aruto. Back to my training with Ithuna. Of course, regarding the forge, I had to become a collector of materials for Ithuna in exchange for lessons. If I like becoming a collector? Of course not I had to collect items that were illogical, like the roots of a mountain or the breath of a fish was this work worth it? Definitely the reason? Some of these trips allowed me to see the other realms. Also, on my first trip to Midgard, I heard a voice calling me, and the voice came from the sky, or to be more specific from a star in the sky, it glowed a red color comparable to my hair. I knew I would have to go to it one day, I already suspected what it was, so I started making preparations. Other things happened, like me getting a new baby brother named Balder, he was the light of the family literally. At birth, it seemed that the sun had visited the room. In my hundred years of existence, I met several people, as well as my other brothers. Vider, Vali, and Hermod, the sons of Njord. Free and Freja, and last but not least, I got to know Edhuna and her daughter Sif better. And to say I was surprised by Sif's personality would be an understatement, she had a mouth as dirty as her mother, and was so stubborn it got on my nerves the reason? When we were about 13 years old, she challenged me to a fight because she knew I trained from a young age, and she had a dream to be the strongest Tyner Jar in Valhalla, surpassing her father Ragnar in combat, so she thought she would fight back a young god would give her a good proof of what she would face in the future. I didn't deny her request as I wanted to see what level she was after training for three years with the father who held the title of most strong Einar Jar of the last centuries. So we had a brief contest of strength and skill, no magic or divine energy. The result was Sif being knocked out the second after the match started. What can I say? I followed the first rule of a fight, which is, hit fast and hit hard, and so I did obviously, I held back, because after all doing Satama's training, increased by a hundred times, since the time I started walking and made me frighteningly strong, I wanted to knock her out, not blow her head off. Unfortunately, after she woke up in the healing chamber after one day, she soon came looking for me demanding a rematch I accepted and knocked her out soon after then a pattern started to emerge, every day she would challenge me again. Did I care for these silly disputes? Initially yes, as I thought it was a waste of time but after much consideration. The Einar Jar is the infantry of the Asgardian army we don't have many numbers, because the Valkyries prefer quality over quantity, so they do not ascend all warriors fallen in battle to become an Einar Jar, they only ascend if the warrior dies gloriously. So these warriors remain partying and fighting in Valhalla's hall, waiting to be called to the last battle. If I indirectly forced Sif to train more to be a better warrior, she would consequently raise the standard of becoming an Einar Jar. With this in mind, made me accept Sif's challenges, and so every year I fought her at least once. Any sane person would have given up on challenging me after several consecutive defeats, with matches that didn't last more than two seconds, but Sif kept trying. That was something I could respect, but let's face it, it was still meaningless. After many challenges and showing no sense of giving up, she ended up earning the respect of the Einar Jar at the age of 13, through a title given by the Einar Jar. Sif the Unshakable Maiden. Honestly, I was happy for her, few are recognized by the Einar Jar so young, in fact, Sif was the youngest. But as soon as she was recognized, her training became more important than anything, so she didn't pass longer in the forge with her mother. I only saw her two or three times in a year, and one of those times was in connection with our annual combat match. Anyway a lot happened, besides, today was an important day because it was the day that might be my graduation as a blacksmith. My task? Forge an artifact yourself and present it to Ithuna, who would deliver the verdict. My choice of the object was a female necklace, but not just any necklace, it had a purpose to be given to someone, if all went well, 
I would borrow a flying ship to go get my partner from the Red Star. When I finished the first item that I forged by my hands, I placed it inside a box and took it towards Idhuna. It's over. I hope you at least made the effort to make this item and not in any other way like that repair to a Valkyria helmet that looked like a baby's work, said Idhuna, taking the box out of my hands. I already told you it was an accident I I lose control I said, embarrassed. Lose control? Boy, there's a good reason for us dwarves not to physically fight inside the forge, because of a mere insult, a forge is a place considered sacred to us, because here we make our creations in a way, we give life to things. As much as they are considered mere objects or tools for other races, for us dwarves forging is an art, that's why when we are angry at someone, we usually insult, you will never see dwarves fighting inside a forge, as it is a total disregard for our livelihood, said it Hunas sternly. But I'm not a dwarf to pursue that way of life, I said. It's true but you're in a dwarf's house. If you were unable to maintain your composure or concentration while forging because of a mere insult, I wouldn't even have bothered to start teaching you something, Idhuna said smiling. Then Idhuna opened the box and took out the necklace I made, she didn't show any reaction at all, she just assessed it. The more time I spent in silence the more nervous I got. Until Idhuna broke the silence. A female necklace? I must say it's beautiful, it's perfect at first sight began Idhuna. I held in a sigh I was nervous, and for good reason, it took me a year to make this necklace out of the right materials. Who are you going to give this? I hope it's not for my daughter because she doesn't like this jewelry much, she prefers a sword and less. Don't tell me it's for you? Said it Yunav in disbelief. But I noticed the small smile. Can you stop joking and say what you think? I said tiredly. I think I got used to talking to this crazy woman 90 years is a long time. I don't see anything that needs improving clean and glamour runes of enchantment are the basics in jewelry forging, but runes of time and space? Hmm. Rune of return to the owner of Bloodhine Genius, 100 cubic meters storage rune, just a few artifacts have this storage space, not to mention time, and space runes are considered complex, said it Hune evaluating the necklace. She spent the next minute considering it in silence. Until she looked at me with a serious face. I swallowed saliva. And then? What do you think? I said nervously. What do I think? If you weren't a warrior, you would be a good blacksmith, said it Huna handing me the necklace. So does that mean that I said hopefully? Yes boy you passed, said it Huna with a smile, and then walked towards her workbench and started looking for something. As she searched I let out a sigh now I'm a full-fledged blacksmith, but blacksmiths are always learning. Idhuna said the blacksmith's best tool is his imagination, now I can finally go crazy with my ideas when starting with. Project number one my own flying ship, inspired by Type Moon's Vimana, the ship of King Gilgamesh. Why? And the answer would be. Why not? Besides, I wouldn't have to borrow someone else's transport again. It's like the saying goes. Nothing crushes a man's spirit more than having to beg for help. Unfortunately I couldn't wait until I built my own ship to pick up my partner, as each day that passed was agony for me, it felt like a part of me was missing, I even knew how far away my partner was. My transport to pick up my partner? I will use Free's flying boat, the Skibladner, which is capable of navigating water, land, and sky, as well as navigating to my objective located in space. How would I do this? Well Free was known for many things the Prince of the Vanner, the God of Fertility, the God of Peace, but his best known title? The biggest Siskin of all time. Free always tried to please his sister Freja with various gifts all gifts were rejected by Freja, the reason was simple, Free always erred in his sister's likes, while he loved her, he didn't know her likes or dislikes, and this led to attempts that failed the most unsuccessful Siskin of all the sister herself found the behavior of her eldest brother disgusting. So, because Freja's birthday is approaching, like a good friend that I am, I'll give Free this necklace to give to Freja, when he's most desperate to find the perfect gift for his sister, and in return, I would borrow Skidbladner for seven days to fetch my partner. I snapped out of my thoughts when I noticed Adhuna coming towards me with two boxes. Here. This is the graduation gift as a blacksmith one is mine the other is from Siv who did it with a little bit of my help, said Idhuna smiling. 
I soon held the two boxes and opened the first box it was a golden belt. I call it Majingjured, its function is quite simple, it works to increase its strength by increasing the user's weight. Sif said she always sees you training with weights, so she thought it would be helpful for you to have a belt that works like a weight that gift was her idea, it Yuna said smiling. A belt that works like a weight? Is that a gravity belt? Well there goes project number 5 on my list, not bad then. Thank you I like the present I said thanking her. It's not me you should thank. That was Sif's gift, said it Yuna smiling. I see Sif I owe you a magic sword. I will start working on it later. I soon opened the next box it was a pair of black gloves, at first glance, they seemed to be made of leather and quite fragile, but when I noticed that I've seen these same gloves before, I already knew their function. I call them Jarn Greeper. Due to your ability to break both the artifact you are forging and the forging hammer by accident, I thought it best to create these gauntlets specifically for you, they are made of tough material, capable of absorbing the weight of your blow, so you don't break anything by accident, said Edhuna smiling. I soon put on my gifts, and activated the bell to be 10 times normal gravity, then felt the effects of the gravity increase. Thank you so much Edhuna, not only for the gifts but for everything I thanked her once more. Haha you're welcome you're like a son that unfortunately, I didn't have but again, if I had a child I wouldn't want it to be with your behavior, Edhuna said mockingly. I could only counterattack with something I knew she hated when anyone mentioned it. Don't worry I also don't think I'd be a good son to you a grandson, though. Maybe, I said smiling. What did she not like me to mention? Her age. Are you calling me an old woman boy? Know that I'm only 535 years old? I'm just a teenager. Yelled at Yuna, as she tried to punch me. I quickly dodged and ran towards the exit. But not before screaming. They say the older you are, the more likely you are to get irritated easily. I yelled as I ran. When I left I could only hear one last scream. Fuck you. As soon as I left the forge, I headed to the Vanner Palace. It was time to negotiate the perfect necklace that will serve as a perfect gift for the sister of a devoted Siskin, by a flying ship borrowed for seven days in the throne room of the Prince of the Vanner, I noticed that he was alone in the room, sitting on his throne mumbling something like, Three days left what gift? Three days left what gift? Now is the time to talk to the oldest Siskin in history. How I should start? With a reference of course. Prince Free I've come to bargain. POV Thor. Free then noticed me in his throne room. Hmm? Ah. My friend Thor. Sorry, but could you come back another time? I'm in the middle of an extremely important reflection, said Free. I don't know if choosing birthday presents should be treated that way, it looks like he's disarming a bomb, and doesn't know which wire to cut. But this works in my favor my dear friend. It won't take up too much of your time I guarantee, I only came here because I would like to make a little exchange with you, I said smiling. Exchange something? What do you want from me? Free asked curiously. First, before I tell you what I want from you, I would like to share with you that I am a blacksmith in full right now. I said smiling. Oh. Congratulations my friend, a great achievement. We must celebrate. You've already done your first centenary, right? Let's drink meat in Valhalla. But they're busy because of my sister's name Dahum. I'm sorry my friend, can we arrange another time? I need to get back to what I was doing before said Free, in an apologetic tone. As expected from the greatest Siskin of the Norse gods honestly, if the Norse pantheon were incest friendly, I bet Free would have asked his sister to marry him, the thought of it makes me shudder, as it reminds me of the Greek pantheon. Or as I like to refer to it. The Alabama of mythologies. Uranus and Gaia. Son fucks his own mother. Kronos and Ray. Brother fucks his own sister. And that's not to mention the future Olympians I understand that, my friend, you're busy but let me show you the item I made as my final task. I said, taking the box and opening it. On it was the necklace that took me a whole year to make with the right items. By Auden. It's magnificent. I've never seen anything like it said free, mesmerized. The glamour rune is working perfectly, thank you my friend free however, I don't have much use for it as you can see, it's a female necklace. My mother doesn't like this style of jewelry, and Siv prefers a sword than a necklace. 
Dot dot I said, smiling innocently. I I understand said free, still hypnotized. I think I will have to be a little more direct. Do you think your sister would like that neck I started to ask, but was soon interrupted. Yes. Ahem I mean, maybe I. I never gave a perfect gift for her, you know the last one was a pair of boots, but she only accepted the gift out of politeness, I know my sister's polite smile, she usually gives that smile when she rejects suitors who try to ask for her hand in marriage I, I don't know if she would like this necklace, but again, I've never given her a necklace like that said free. Um I'm sure this necklace fits her tastes, don't you think? Said an affirmation. Yes maybe, dot 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 how do you know she'll like it? Asked Free curiously. It's just a feeling I replied smiling. Total bullshit I just wanted the fucking flying ship while the necklace is useful because of the time and space runes, and it Hunam approved, I had no idea of Frage's jewelry tastes. But again, at this point, I look like a salesperson trying to sell a product of dubious provenance I had to be convincing. It is quite beautiful and unique as I haven't seen anything like it, I'm sure she will like your present, my friend I still have to decide my present for my lovely sister, said Free with a sad smile. Is it so hard to get between the lines, Free? You know what fuck it. How about you give this necklace to your sister? As I said before, I don't have much use for it I said. Really thank you very much my friend said Free trying to snatch it from my hand. I soon closed the box containing the necklace and took it out of his reach. Calm down my friend let's not be too hasty, while I would like to give you this necklace. I wanted something in exchange for you I explained. Ah. You said you wanted to bargain, right? What would you want for the necklace? Free asked excitedly. Here we go, I heard you had a special ship capable of sailing anywhere I said. You want the Skibladner no. That does not gonna happen. I can't said free already denying the request i was already expecting that it will be borrowed i said quickly interrupting him what free spoke confused i will give you the necklace and in return you will lend me your ship for a few days i explained even so thor while i respect our friendship you're asking too much of me the skibladner is not just any boat it was made to transport us gods and einer jar them in wartime unobtrusively because it doesn't emit residual magic like teleportation runes and uses Sinjutsu to camouflage itself with the environment, it's the only ship from our pantheon that does that. In addition to having an internal forge, powered by the energy of any star, for repairing weapons and barracks, thanks to magical space runes. It is very expensive to build another one that provides all this. There is only one other ship that does the same thing a Tamra's solar ship. Explained Free. I knew that and that was exactly why I wanted him. I understand Freeskidbladner is unique, but so is this necklace. It's made of rare materials besides having magic runes, there is no other like it. I won't take your ship, I'll just borrow it for a few days, and then I'll return the Skidbladner to you, I said, trying to convince him. I don't know I don't know if I need this exchange I think I can get another gift, said Free undecided. I see in this case. I wish you good luck and I'm sorry if I wasted your time I said heading towards the exit with a small smile. So. I think I'll give this necklace to Freja on her name day, I'm sure she won't receive a gift like this, I wonder what expression she will make for such a unique gift, I continued talking as I walked to the door. As I spoke, I could hear Free talking quietly behind me. I don't need it I don't need it I don't need it, whispered Free, trying to convince himself. Just need one more push, my siskin friend, I wish you the best of luck in your search for the perfect gift, my friend free. But remember that it's only three days until your sister's name day I said, I didn't even have to leave before I heard free screaming. Wait. I needed all this time I had a smile on my face. When leaving the palace of the Vanner gods, I had a miniature viking ship. Now that I had the ship for a few days I'll finally go pick up my partner. Thor. I looked towards the voice calling me and realized it was my old friend Sif. Sif? What are you doing here? Shouldn't you be in training camps yet? I asked confused. My father had business with the leader Vanern Jord, I came with him, explained Sif. Just then Sif watched me and noticed the majingered belt I was wearing. I see you are wearing your new gift, said Sif smiling at me. Yes thanks for the gift, 
I will reward you in the future, I said smiling. Um really, dot 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 you know there's something you could do for me, said Sif in a suggestive tone. Who the hell is this woman? An imposter? What can I do for you? I asked. Fight me. Said Sif instantly. Now I was sure she wasn't an imposter here's my battle mad friend. No, we've already fought recently, be patient, I said. It's not fair. Do you only accept my challenges once a year Sif said in disgust. I really don't know if a one-sided massacre can be called a challenge. I fight you once a year because I can see how much you've improved over the previous year, I explained impassively. You're not fun, mumbled Sif. Before I could retaliate, another voice was heard. Sif. Let's get going. I looked over and saw Sif's father, Ragnar, carrying a small chest, it was probably a reward from a completed quest. Ah. Prince Thor, it's an honor to see you again, Ragnar said as he bowed his head. Honestly I've never seen a couple as different as Edhuna and Ragnar I still remember the day I saw Edhuna together with her husband, she looked like a teenager in love, nor did she seem like the dirtiest mouth and violent half-dwarf of the forge. I mocked her as soon as her husband left. She took her anger out on my next quest the quest? I had to collect the fucking blood of a Draugr, but was it worth mocking Edhuna? Absolutely. Ragnar, it's been a while I'm just passing through. I came to settle some matters with Prince Free, I said smiling. It was then that Sif noticed the Skidbladner in my hands. Is this what I think it is? Asked Sif raising her eyebrows. Then Ragnar noticed it too, and he was surprised. The Skidbladner I don't want to sound too intrusive, but why are you, my prince, in possession of Prince Free's ship? Asked Ragnar curiously. Well, you see soon, I will go on a quest, and Skidbladner will be essential. I explained to the best of my ability, without giving too much detail. A quest? Right now? But Frege's name day is in three days remember the last time Mrs. Frigg did to you for missing a very important day? Asked Sif in disbelief. I shivered. Yes Sif, I remembered very well, it was the day I made a new rule, don't mess with the person who can literally transfer someone else's pain to you. I will be present on Frege's name day. I will only go on my quest as soon as the festivities are over I said. Partner wait just a little longer soon we'll break some skulls time skip. Three days later, Frege's name day birthday. POV Thor. Because Sif reminds me about what my mom did to me the last time I missed an important day I decided to stay for the festivities. I wasn't much into partying. I usually trained, forged items, or studied new runes. Unfortunately, in these 100 years of my new life, I haven't shown certain interests that other Asgardians had one of those was partying and drinking non-stop besides breaking things in the process. Actually, a god's name day was like a birthday, but there was a slight difference the party was big depending on the hierarchy. And while the party lasted about a whole day and the food and drink were plentiful, the difference is what happened during the celebration like drinking competitions, axe throwing fights over something simple, competitions for the hand of a woman I had never participated in this. It wasn't that I wasn't interested in participating I just thought I could do something more productive elsewhere. However there was another reason why I didn't like parties I didn't want to repeat the same feat in my centenary. The feat? Well first I must explain something a curious fact. Alcohol is part of our lifestyle, you could find a five-year-old child with a glass of meat in one hand and a wooden sword in the other, and that was considered normal. In fact, you would be considered strange if you hadn't been drinking since you were young. If I say I wasn't surprised when my mother handed me a drinking horn filled with meat instead of water at our family dinner when I was four, I would be lying. But I soon adapted to this small change from my past lifestyle, for the first time in my two lives, I felt what it was like to have a hangover, and I definitely didn't like it. However, I liked the mead. The hangover didn't stop me from drinking more, and over time I got used to a large amount of alcohol in my body. But, I changed a little when I was drunk let's just say the drunk self is a little volatile, that's why I never intended to let the drink consume me until my first centenary came. It was the day that I got the most out of control, as it meant a hundred years in this world, so I decided to let go a little I drank, fought, drank some more, and fought even more when I try to remember that day, it's all a blur.
but according to some rumors that circulated in Valhalla the next day, I did so many things that my mother from my previous life would be disappointed. Some of the things were? I put Odin himself in a healing chamber after an arm wrestling match. I fought against several men who ended up in the healing chamber drinking straight from a barrel of mead and knocking out anyone who tried to take it from me. Damage the Valhalla Hall. At least there were no fatalities as far as I know, and that was just some of the rumors. The funny thing is, I didn't get scolded, quite the contrary, my exploits were admired by others I got a title that day too. The Drunk Calamity. I didn't think it was the most baddest title but it is what it is. But due to this episode of mine, I had more control over how much I drank. And I never exaggerated again. But here I was, at a name day party for a goddess who was the princess of the Vanner, maybe I can drink some more, right? It wouldn't do anything wrong time skip. Two hours later third person POV drink it. 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 These were the cheering cheers of a group of men and women in Valhalla's hall, during the celebration of Princess Vanner Frage's name day. These people were rooting for two people who ended up in a drinking competition one of them was the old looking god, he was drinking mead from a traditional drinking horn, it was the god of the seas, Eger. The other man, however, considerably young looking, what stood out the most were his long red hair and golden veins in some parts of his body that, and the big barrel of mead he was drinking from that was one of the princes of Asgard, the son of King Odin Thor. As people cheered, it only took a few seconds to see who was the winner. And against all odds. Bam it was Thor who had thrown the barrel to the ground, breaking it in the process, showing that he had finished his drink first. Yeah Thor. 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 The fans now claim the winner. As the crowd clamored, Thor asked forcefully. Hick is there no one else, unfortunately. Thor was already showing the signs that made him deserve his title given in the commemoration of his centenary. The drunk calamity one of those signs? Crisis of Hiccup. Waitress. Hick bring me another barrel of mead. Ask Thor. Yes, my prince. The waitress immediately replied, then began to run in search of a new barrel. Thor don't you think that was enough? Asked Eger. Hick nah I'm just having a little fun one more barrel and I'll finish, Thor replied. You said the same thing when you took the third barrel of mead by yourself, the one you just broke on the ground was the third of fifth, said Eger in disbelief. Oh. Hick I don't remember saying that Hick maybe one more barrel will clear my mind. Said Thor. You said that in the twenty-second barrel grumbled Eger. Heads up. A voice resounded in the hall. He was the leader of the Vanner, Njord, god of navigation and fishing, and beside him was his wife Scotty, goddess of skiing, hunting, winter, and mountains. The hitherto unusual couple had reconciled but still held the title of fastest divorce in the Nordic pantheon. Only 23 days of marriage due to differences in where they lived until they found a common place and reconciled. Only Thor, having lived two lives, discovered that the place was what would come to be called Greenland. Njord then held up a drinking horn and began a little speech. Today is a big day. For it was today that my beloved daughter came into this world, for 130 years she has graced us with her presence. I would be lying if I said that the day of her birth was the most important day the truth is, for a parent it is most important to see their children grow up. Every day is precious. Said Njord. Yeah. The hall roared in approval. For my daughter Freja. Said Njord as he raised the horn towards a woman. This woman had a small smile and was endowed with an unearthly beauty she was Freja, the younger sister of Free and daughter of Njord and Scotty. For Freja. Shouted the people of Valhalla. May the festivities come back. Said Njord. And then the hall went back to eating and drinking except for a small group. Such a beauty. Today will be the day I go to quarters said someone, it was Hermod, the son of Odin with a mortal woman. Ha! Huh. And do you think she will accept you? Look at you. You are a bad joke. Mocked the closest person, it was Vali, one of Odin's sons, who was abandoned by his mother. Want to know another bad joke? Your mom scoffed Hermod. Hermod was soon met with a punch at his face and hurled away. Vali we've already talked about this you need to control your temper more, said a man nearby, sighing, it was Vider, another son of Odin. Control my temper, he insulted my mother. Shouted Vali indignantly. 
While I understand your anger, you shouldn't let someone get you mad so easily, Vider said rolling his eyes. What would you have done then? Ask Vali. Well I'd punch him, Vider said. And isn't that what I just did? Ask Vali in disbelief. Yes but you sent Hermod flying to the wrong place, explained Vider. Huh? What do you mean by that? Ask Vali, still confused. Look at the trajectory, brother explained Vider, pointing to where Hermod was. It was then that Vali noticed. Oh oh, shit said Vali regretfully. Hee <laughs> hee. Hi brother I'm sorry that I spilled your drink, said Hermod nervously. In front of him was Thor, looking down at the barrel that lay on the ground and spilled mead. It was then that Thor slowly turned to face his brother Hermod. Hermod you better have a good reason said Thor, glaring at Hermod. Another sign of the drunk calamity? Well it would be violence. You see when Thor is sober he thought clearly about the pros and cons before resorting to violence if there will be consequences if it is worth it wasting his time in a small fight when Thor is drunk, though. Violence is not the answer it's the question. And the answer is always, yes. Brother, please let me explain. It was Vali's fault. I began Hermod. But Thor didn't hear the rest and grabbed Hermod by the collar, lifted him off the ground, and flung him through the nearest window. Those closest to Thor moved away, as they knew what was to come, Vali Hick come here brother Hick, I just want to have a civilized conversation, I won't hurt you well, not too much at least. Said Thor as he swept his eyes through the crowd, searching for his brother. Location. Vider and Vali. If I were you I'd start running said Vider turning to Vali just to see that his brother was already gone. Hmm he's learning fast reflected Vider on his brother Vali's reaction. Well there's only just one way to get Thor out of his quest for blood waitress. Bring a barrel full of mead. And be quick. Or if not, Valhalla will turn to rubble again. Said Vider, looking at the nearest maid. Ah. Yes, sir. Said the maid as she ran away. Why give Thor more mead? Well when Thor enters this state, the only way to defeat him is to get him even drunker and hope he black out. Location. Table of the main banner gods. Um where's free? Njord asked his wife. He was here before he said he was going to get Freja's gift, explained Scotty. Oh no said Freja, putting her hands to her face and regretting it. Don't act like that Freja it's your brother's way of telling you that he loves you, Njord chided. I know that dad it's just while I recognize Free's attempts, he exaggerates a lot in the gifts. I still remember the last gift the boots were very flashy, they were the color of gold. But it wasn't just that they were made of a material that made my feet itch for two days. Besides that, I found out that at night they glowed in the dark dad. Do you know what Free told me when I asked him why he gave me some boots that glow in the dark? He said, so you don't lose them. Frey just said in exasperation. Ha 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 and George started to laugh until he was interrupted by a nudge from his wife in the ribs. Ah I know your brother can act shamefully. But he's still your brother, and he loves you that's just who he is. George tried to explain. I just hope he doesn't try anything Frey just said. Just then the doors of Valhalla's hall opened. My beloved sister. Shouted a voice. Everyone in the room looked towards the voice. It was Prince Free with his hands holding a small box. Free then proceeded to walk towards his family's table as he spoke. On this memorable day, I come here to present you with the symbol of your beauty. Free said with a big smile on his face. And then he handed the box to his sister, Freja. Meanwhile, Freja had a nervous smile on her face, oh brother, I appreciate this wonderful gift, said Freja as she took the box. Open the box sister. Offered Free. Ah certainly, said Freja. Initially, Freja did not want to open the present, the shame of the golden boots was still rooted in her memory. But she still did what her brother asked. Only to come across the most beautiful necklace she had ever seen. Free it's beautiful. Freja said smiling sincerely. I call him Air Brisingaman. Said Free smiling. No one seemed to notice Free's slip, as the guests were looking at Freja's beautiful smile, and Freja was still looking at the necklace. The moment was beautiful until being damaged by Free who started to cry. Ugh sniff I finally did it after over a hundred years, sniff Free said as he took out a handkerchief and wiped his tears. Then Freja stopped smiling. Free please stop and go sit down, Freja said. Ugh sniff yes sister, 
Freeze said while still wiping his tears. Freja then sighed, but then smiled again. Thank you brother, said Freja, while looking at the necklace. But a question popped into Freja's mind, she knew that this item was unique due to the runes, and the quality of the materials the necklace was forged, but Freja knew that her brother was not a blacksmith so who made it? Freja asked softly, looking at the necklace curiously. Location. Volley, POV. Third person. While Freja wondered who made such a necklace, there was a hunt in the Hall of Valhalla the young god Vali, son of Odin, is known for his bloodlust and fights was hiding under the table. Should I can't leave the hall without being noticed by someone there's only one person who can help me right now whispered Vali. Vali then made a simple communication rune, the one he was trying to contact was an old friend of Odin's children, and who helped free graze them herself, she could be considered an older sister. When the rune showed a sign of response, a Valkyrie figure soon formed. Vali? What do you want? Brunhold. I need help. I only have seconds. I know you probably don't like me very much after breaking your little sister wrist's heart, but I really need your help. I don't want to end up with two broken arms again. Help me. Thor is drunk. Said Vali quickly. You're right, Brunhold replied reflecting. A ray of hope flickered across Vali's face. So will you help me? Asked Vali hopefully. What? No I. Said you were right about me not liking you very much after you broke my sister's heart, Brunhold said with a small smile on her face. Ah said Vali surprise. By the way your seconds are over, Brunhold said with a bigger smile, before ending the rune call. As soon as Brunhold finished speaking the table where Vali was hiding under it was raised. Hick I found you said a voice with an innocent tone. At that moment, Vali knew he would experience a world of pain. Meanwhile, Freja was still at the table with her parents and brother, until a young god approached. Goddess Freja the poems about her beauty don't do justice to be in her presence, may I ask you for a dance? Said the young god in a confident tone. It was Kvasser, god of inspiration. Certainly, Kvasser, Freja replied with a polite smile. From the smile, some people could already consider that it would be another rejection of a suitor for Freja's consort. Don't misunderstand. Freyju enjoyed the attention the other gods gave her, she's the goddess of beauty, but over the years, she stopped being interested. After all, they all had ulterior motives, She is the goddess of beauty, as well as wealth and lust, she knew what they wanted, she always knew, it was easy to figure out intentions through one's thoughts, when Freyju would lean against a person, even if only a brief touch, she would feel their deepest desires. But she wanted something more. She wanted someone to feel for her more than desire Freja was the goddess of love, but never in her 130 years did find anyone who saw her with eyes beyond greedy. Due to her having the title of most beautiful and richest goddess, she knew that most, if not all, male gods who had asked for her hand in marriage, saw her as a trophy. The irony. The young goddess Vanner didn't want to be wanted as a trophy she wanted to be loved. But then during the dance between Freja and Kvasser, something interrupted the music and caught the attention of most of the guests. Boom the noise of an explosion resounded in Valhalla's hall, the cause? The body collided with a wall at high speed, resulting in a large hole in the wall, and a pile of debris on the floor. And someone was walking towards the pile of rubble. Hick get up brother I haven't finished teaching you how to punch properly Hick then get up. I'll make you learn a little bit about the projectile motion, said the person. It was Thor who was walking slowly towards the pile of debris it was then that the pile of debris moved, and showed that it was the god Vali. He didn't look good it looked like his left arm and right leg had been broken, the armor that protected his chest, had a mark that looked like a fist. Cough Thor did I need it all? I think I broke some ribs cough said Vali, while coughing up blood. If you're breathing hick then you're fine Thor replied. Shick off I can bring you a barrel meat if you stop with that said Vali, trying to convince his brother. You didn't convince me said Thor, who then grabbed Vali's collar with one hand and lifted him off the ground. Thor. A voice shouted. Thor then looked towards the voice it was Sif with two barrels of mead. Do you want? Drop the body first, Sif said. Um sweet nectar, Thor said. Thor then released his brother and walked towards Sif. It was then that the crowd dispersed, while two people took Vali's body and carried it towards a healing chamber. The rest of the festivities continued as if nothing had happened. 
After all it was just another day in Valhalla time skip. One day. POV Thor. Ow what a fucking headache I shouldn't have gone overboard on the meat I said rubbing my temples. The hangover sucks, but that wouldn't delay my schedule. I already took too long it was time to make use of this stealth flying ship and go get my partner. I looked at the miniature dracker in my hands. What's missing now are those hitting the road country songs I said smiling. Time skip. 5 minutes, location. Asgard Palace. Third person, POV. What did you say? Resounded a voice in the royal room. It was Frigg, who was sitting on the bed, who had screamed in disbelief. The cause of this was because Odin had returned from the last meeting recently between the leaders of the pantheons. The new leader of the Greek pantheon didn't go to the meeting, said Odin. I don't like this Odin he took power only a century ago, and has already closed himself off from the world, not even Uranus dared not attend the meeting, should we expect a conflict? Asked Frigg worried. If there is it is more likely that the territories of the Egyptians and Sumerians will be the most affected due to the proximity we have nothing to fear. But I will insist on being prepared, but it's not from Kronos that I expect conflict, replied Aden. It's the Jodan, isn't it? Asked Frigg. Yes they are braver, said Aden wearily. Your mother was a Joe Frigg start saying until she was interrupted by Aden. While my mother may be a Jodan I am a king before a son, said Aden. Frigg was silent, she knew the cruel relationship the Jodan Bastla had with her son Aden. And she knew what Aden was capable of after all, it was Aden who brought the Vanner gods to their knees in the last war. Aden only let George remain the leader of the Vanner and his future sons, the title of prince because of politics. What happens now then? Asked Frigg. We'll prepare and wait if I'm right there will be a war again. I just hope we get it over with before it gets the attention of the other pantheons, we can't show weakness. Not with the leader of the Greeks showing that attitude said Aden. Frigg could only agree the situation was not good. Location. Space. POV Thor. I think most of the kids in my previous life who dreamed of being astronauts would live their dream right now. Skibladner is very fast, much faster than the speed of light. I had already left the solar system in which Midgard Earth was. And was heading towards the red dot I knew my partner was out of this galaxy, but by the speed of this ship. I estimated that I would reach my destination in approximately 72 hours, as much as I could just teleport to the location I was pretty sure I wouldn't be 100% accurate. Not to mention the residual magic of the teleportation rune would alert the so-called primal deities and I didn't want them to meddle where they weren't called, that was a bad habit of the gods to be intrusive, and think you can do whatever you want out of being a god. I refused to be that way. The reason? If there were some things I learned in my life as a mortal were. Every action has a reaction. And Murphy's fucking law. Also, I didn't want to be known as Zeus. Because while I wasn't very studious about Norse mythology, Greek mythology was another story, Zeus was a good example not to follow the future lord of the skies, and ruler of the Olympians. Had the bad habit of transforming himself and wanting to fuck everything that had a hole I still remember the story that he turned into the rain just to fuck a woman Greek gods are strange, it was better if I stayed away from the Greek pantheon. Even though the rapist shapeshifter wasn't born yet, I had a feeling that he and I would definitely not get along. Not to mention the others. Hera. The vengeful wife who likes to get revenge on the innocent children of her cheating husband. Poseidon. Another rapist kidnapper, arrogant as his little brother. Ares. The man with serious anger issues. Aphrodite. The woman who started a war for the title of most beautiful. And so the list goes on I want to get away from this pile of shit. Time skip. 72 hours later 3 Earth days, location. Space, POV Thor. When I arrived at my destination, I expected to come across a red star I was surprised that it's not exactly a standard star. It was a bright red nebula, with the shape of a star. What scared me was the size of this nebula, it was easily bigger than the sun several times, plus there seems to be a lightning storm inside. But I could feel it it felt like it had a core and the core was calling me. Finally it's about time if I got you I said smiling. So I took a small chain and tied it around my ankle. Because I didn't want to get lost in the nebula, so I thought I'd better use the idea Theseus had in the labyrinth, 
and if they accuse me of plagiarism, just remember it's not plagiarism if you do it first. Well here we go, I said, before jumping off the ship. I was going to leave the ship behind as I didn't want to damage it too much from the lightning storm in the nebula. I spent my time going towards the core, and when I found it, I could only see a small white sphere with red details, it was the size of a baseball ball. As soon as I got close enough I grabbed it, and then the giant nebula had just vanished. As soon as the nebula vanished I heard a voice and I remembered that voice perfectly, even though it had been over 100 years. Hello there said the voice behind me. The one above all I said smiling turning me towards the voice. As soon as I turned around, there he was still in Stanley form. Ah! I understood the reference, said Stanley one above all, with a knowing smile. POV Thor. So I thought you wouldn't communicate with me after the talking letter, I said confused. I never said that, I said that we would not communicate via letters I never said that we would never meet again. Although while I'm here I'm not either said one above all smiling. Has anyone ever said that you are a confusing person to understand? I asked. One above all just laughed. Ha 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 in fact, there have been several who have said that to me. It's always fun to listen again. Said one above all, in a good mood. In a way, I'm happy to see a familiar face from my previous life, even if it's the fake one, but there are things I need to ask first while I unnecessarily would like to know more about your eternal life I have some questions I would like to ask I said. By all means, make yourself comfortable and have a seat, said one above all gesturing with one hand. I was confused I was in the emptiness of space, but after I blinked for a second I was in a living room. Omnipotence was scary, but it was still so up. I then sat on the couch that was behind me, while the one above all sat in an armchair across from me. That was cool I said, smiling. He thanks but then, about the questions began one above all. Aren't you omniscient too? I asked confused. I thought he was going to read my mind or something yes but you would like to ask, not me I may have all the answers to your questions but, you don't have all the questions for my answers, explained one above all. I just wanted him to give easier to understand advice did he smile again? Oh yeah omniscience. Okay let's start with the basics while I understand it was my stupid choice that brought me into this world why Thor? Why reborn as a god? I'm way off the canon because of that I asked curiously. Um a better way to explain it would be this way I chose to reincarnate you as Thor because it was easier for you to get involved, said one above all. Involve me? With what exactly? I insisted. Everything one above all replied. What do you mean? I asked confused. Everything? What kind of answer was that? Well you, who have watched the Marvel movies know the capabilities of the Time Stone, right? I have that same ability. And much more. Before you even chose that door I already predicted several realities, one of those realities you chose the door of heaven, and lived happily with your perfect world. But there is also another reality in which you choose the door of heaven and go crazy in your perfect world, because deep down you considered that world a big lie, after all, the perfect for a man is to know how to live with his faults, because that's the only way he will know his qualities, explained one above all. Okay, that was scary. So did I go crazy in some reality? Nice, I said. Haha <laughs> I suppose all human madness manifests itself in an unusual way, or should I say unique, mused one above all. Maybe but back to the subject if you knew which door I would choose and chose for me to be reborn as Thor, so I could get involved in the whole story, you still haven't fully answered my question why. I asked again. Yes, he said he would like it if I get involved in the story, but I could do that if I reincarnate as any other race, so why be specifically reborn as a god? What kind of entertainment was this? Hmm how can I say you intrigue me replied one above all. What? I ask not understanding. You see, the very concept of a god is unimaginable for a human. I then wondered what an immortal would be like with the soul of a mortal immortal soul, with the eternity of a god I was intrigued, I wanted to see this result, so I went to limbo, the place where repentant souls reflect on their life before finding the peace to move on. At first I tried to find the soul of any human, but it didn't work as they were too. Uninteresting, as I didn't want anyone with a selfish bent I immediately discarded them, so I proceeded with the souls who died being selfless, who had been in limbo for a while, 
when I offered the proposal they accepted, but I feel disappointed because of how easily they corrupted themselves with the new life, so I judge them according to their achievements. And I erase them explain one above all. Wait erased? Better not to ask. But then I found you. A soul lost in limbo, which died young who didn't regret your own life, but didn't want to move on, because you wanted to enjoy more of your life I was intrigued, considering the centuries you spent in limbo. That's when I knew you were the soul I was looking for your answer not knowing what I'd do if I got a second chance, just confirmed it replied one above all. I think I understand the entertainment he wants what would an immortal being with a mortal soul be like? I feel like a laboratory experiment. I think I understand you're the scientist and I'm the experiment. I said impassively. In a way yes, you're right. But I've never imposed my will on you I've always let you make your own choices, I'm just curious, said one above all. If you are omniscient, why are you curious? That doesn't make sense, I said. He just smiled. Well I treat life like a good book I must flip page by page. While I may know what you can become, I'm more curious to know what you want to be said one above all with a smile. I was silent I really didn't think it was a bad exchange. He wanted some entertainment, and I just wanted to live more even if I have to live in this universe where fanservice is a law I would enjoy what else life has to offer me. Very well. I think it's time for me to leave see you next time, fake Stanley, I said, getting up from the couch and heading towards the door, which I assumed was the exit. I opened the door and could see Skid Bladner. As soon as I got out the door started to close. But I still heard Stan Lee's copy speaking one last time before the door closed. I hope you like your two gifts. And by the way. Who says I'm fake? I turned around and saw that the door was gone. Well that was as cool as it was troublesome, I said. My current life has become a movie that the living court itself is watching great. Wait gifts. I looked around and found nothing, but the core I had in my hands was gone. There was only one location that I didn't check. The Skibladner. I then headed towards Dracker and on deck, I found the present. My personal skull breaker them Jolner. It was the version from Record of Ragnarok but with one difference, I could feel that there was nothing organic about this thing. But then what will the awakened form look like? Should I do the test drive? Better not at least, not before I build my project number 7 the ghost room, where I'll be able to unleash all of my divine power without having to worry about drawing unwanted attention. As soon as I picked up Mjolnir, I noticed that it looked like its weight was as light as a feather. I then saw that it had a little note taped to it. So I read it. Here's one of your gifts, the hammer might be familiar, but it's different at the same time. It will have a very different awakened form, in addition to the ability to shrink. For your other gift, you need to have a mirror to check it out, as promised you now have a true form. But power always has a price in your case, it's the ability to think clearly. I have a good name for your true form, I call it. The Berserker Rage. Good luck my son, I expect great things from you. That's what was written wait a sec need a mirror to check it out? I soon ran towards Skidbladner's inner forge. Time skip. 30 minutes. With some resources that I brought, plus the resources already available at the forge, I managed to forge a small temporary mirror. As I checked my body and found nothing at first sight out of the ordinary, I knew I had to check my back, hence the mirror. And as soon as I checked there was something I didn't have before the conversation with the one above all. A tattoo. I suspected this was the seal for my true form, which I honestly don't know when I would use. After all, the note itself had said that the price of power was my sanity plus the name Berserker Rage rang some alarms in my mind. But I'll think about it more another time. Well there's not much to do here I think it's time to go back, but maybe I can catch a few things along the way a black star's heart can do a lot of things I said. So I turned the Skibladner towards the Milky Way and started my way back to Asgard while picking up what I could on the way. It would be useful in the future in my own forge. Third person POV, location. Jotunheim, a shadowy figure, wearing a black cape and with a hood covering his face walked through the frozen lands of the realm of one of the oldest races, the Jodans. His destination was a castle of great proportions. The giant door opened, as the figure entered the castle the figure moved through the castle, being faced by several giants, 
until reaching a large hall that had several chairs and tables of large proportions. All chairs were occupied by giants, but one chair stood out from the rest. What do you want here? said a giant. Sitting on a chair, which looked like a throne. Are you the one who rules this castle? asked the shadowy figure. I am Utgard, ruler of this castle and the Jotun race. Now I'll ask you one more time, what do you want here? asked the giant, now identified as Utgard. If you listen to my proposal maybe a friend replied the shadowy figure. As much as the shadowy figure was unidentifiable the only thing that wasn't covered was its mouth, which at that moment only had a smile. POV Thor. My return to Asgard was smooth, I didn't encounter any setbacks, I took a heart of a black star, the tail of a comet, and the heart of a red star here and there, and other basic things for my future creations. It was time to build my forge and to build my things in peace, I decided to move from the royal palace of Asgard to the Nordic territory in Midgard, which would be the future of Norway. Why would I do that? Well I would have more space and peace to relax and build my stuff, without prying eyes. There was no way I was going to forge in Asgard, as there were certain projects I wish I could remain secret, when I told my parents I was moving, my mother Frigg didn't like it at all, I suppose she doesn't like her kids being away, she's like a mother bear. My brothers, however, didn't mind and offered to help me with the move, but I soon declined. My forge in Midgard would be built by my hands, as would my new residence. It will take a while but it will be my new home. Also, I wanted my house to be built in a more modern design, with the forge just below the house. After selecting the ideal location, which would be the lakeside, I immediately started building. Time skip. Six months. After six months of collecting materials and building my new house and forge I was finally finished. And it was perfect. I think it's because I built it with my own hands I felt attached to the result. I never thought I would use the Rakage's armor to help me build it as it came in very handy when I was collecting the heart of a star. Now, many would consider the heart of a star too dangerous to use in Midgard, but it was for one of these reasons that I sought to learn how to forge in magic runes. Using my acquired knowledge, I was able to store the heart of a star inside a plasma ball core. The power of the sun in the palm of my hand. Maybe it's better to stop with the references, but it was still a good movie. The best Spider-Man. And no one will change my mind. Anyway the reason for resorting to this type of energy was simple unlimited energy. Well at least until the fusion process stops producing energy due to the fuel, which would be hydrogen, runs out of course generally, when a star dies, depending on its mass, it could become a black hole my solution. I made a rune in the outer area of the plasma ball, so when the star is about to die the rune will activate, and it will teleport the plasma ball far away from the Milky Way for safety precautions, as soon as the first rune activates, another rune located inside the plasma ball will activate, and what does this rune do? Well first of all, a curious fact. In my first life, I always enjoyed reading about space and because of that, I have some basic knowledge, nothing compared to great minds. But I was sure of one thing a black hole was the last boss in space. So I set myself an impossible task kill a black hole. Obviously, it wasn't easy at all it was like. Making the challenge of playing Dark Souls without armor and equipment, and without evolving the character oh shit. The flashbacks. Anyway, even in my other life, black holes were still a mystery, one of the theories that explain the end of black holes? It came from one of the most brilliant minds in the world at the time. The theory explains that black holes can evaporate after long periods. And that's exactly what the plasma ball's inner rune would do when activated, it would speed up the time inside the plasma ball. Obviously, due to the complexity of the rune, it had certain limitations. The star was one of the few things the rune could activate, besides that, the area affected by the rune was very controlled, since it would only affect inside the plasma ball. I made these runes as a safety measure as I didn't want a black hole to appear in the ground, so if something went wrong with the plasma ball, the runes would activate immediately. With the energy of a star fueling my home and personal forge, and with runes distributing that energy to every room in the house, and functioning as a replacement for home appliances. I felt the comfort the 21st century had to offer in an ancient time. Runes dotted around the property would trick the minds of curious mortals, unfortunately, 
they weren't as effective against supernatural beings, as it depended too much on the target's power time skip. Two hours later POV Thor. Ah finally a well-deserved rest I said as I relaxed seated at the recliner chair. Thanks to Mjolnir's ability to shrink, I was able to bring it indoors, and it didn't take up much space. It is the shrunken form had the same proportions as Marvel's Mjolnir, and was now located on the bedside table beside the recliner chair I was sitting on. Maybe I can take a nap before I go to work at the forge I said, already closing my eyes and leaning back in the chair. Unfortunately it seems that the universe was against me because as soon as I reclined the chair knock knock, I heard a knock at the door damn it's night already, who the hell would come to visit me at this hour, I said cursing. After all, it was after midnight. As soon as I opened the door I ran into my friend Free. Thor. Ugh something terrible happened, Sniff Free said between sobs. That's when I realized he had a face that looked like he'd been crying for days. And the news he gave me something terrible? What happened to him to be crying like this? Free come in and calm down I said, inviting him into my house. As soon as Free entered, he headed for the living room. What a weird object. Said Free looking at the sofa. Don't stare sit down, I said. Ah is it even comfortable? Said Free leaning back on the couch. Well I want to show you my new home here in Midgard could you tell me why you came here so late at night and crying? And what terrible news? I asked. Ugh certainly it's my sister Freja Free said while whimpering. Has. Something terrible happened to Freja? Was she hurt or something? If so, I wonder who the fool was who hurt her who in their right mind would hurt the princess of the Vanner gods. Sniff the necklace I gave her the one you forged said Free. Huh? Free stop whining and explain better I said. My sister's necklace the Brisingaman is gone. Ugh, Free said. He was crying because did his sister lose her necklace? Damn it, Free. I then slapped him on the back of his head. Slap, ouch. Why did you do that? Asked Free staring at me while massaging the back of his neck. Idiot it's just a necklace it's not like it's the greatest treasure in the world, you might as well go to the dwarf's forge and trade for a replacement. Hell, if you can pay me, I can even make another one, after all. I forged at the Brisingaman, I said, walking to a bookcase, where I kept most of the projects I considered trivial, written on scrolls. Do you don't understand my friend? It's been five days since Freja has refused to leave her room. My dad even offered to pay for another one, but she refused. She doesn't want a replacement as she considered it an insult to my first successful gift. Ugh she's crying golden tear, Thor. She only cries gold when the sadness and lamentation are unbearable, she considers the Brisingaman irreplaceable, as it was the best gift she received, explained Free. From that tone it sounded serious however. My mind was thinking of other things, like. How does she cry gold? Do Freyja's gold tears have a different quality than regular gold? Well at least that explains why she has the title of the richest goddess. My father and mother offered a reward to whoever found the necklace without Freja knowing of course but. At least, your uncle Loki spoke about someone who might know the location of the necklace, said Free. I don't like where this conversation is going he even stopped crying, and it looks like he's been waiting for me to ask. Did you know that the Jotun are personifications? And did you know that their leader, Utgard is the personification of wisdom? Maybe he knows who stole the necklace, Free asked looking at me expectantly. Yes Free but I don't understand what you expect me I said until I was interrupted by Free, who jumped off the couch and grabbed my shoulders. Come with me to Jotunheim. Said Free. Why the hell would I participate in this quest? I'm sorry Free. But I don't see any reason for me to participate in this quest I said pulling away from Free. Oh, Free lamented. I had better things to do there were certain things I needed for my self-sufficient private garden. When I returned to the bookcase, I looked for a specific scroll when I found it, I opened it it was a map, of Africa to be exact. Why do I have a map of Africa? The answer was simple I was on a treasure hunt the treasure? Well POV. Third person. As soon as Thor opened the scroll, Prince Free realized it was a map. Free was curious as he noticed that Thor was facing a specific drawing, which shared the scroll with the map. It looked like a plant. It was then that Free asked. What is that? Why do you have this map? Isn't that part of the Egyptians' territory? 
Ask free confused. I don't care about the Egyptians I don't have any business with them I'm just on a treasure hunt, Thor explained, still looking at the map. Free was still confused but even more curious. What treasure? Ask free. I'm hunting this, Thor said, pointing to the drawing beside the map. The plant? Said free uncertainly. Yes, said Thor. A plant is more important than my sister's situation? Ask free in disbelief. This plant? Absolutely said Thor. Thor didn't even hesitate when he answered. Free looked indignant, but he wanted to know what this plant was, for Thor seemed so obsessed with it. This plant is it for potions or something? Ask Free? Maybe but it's not the main use, well not for me. So as you can see I'm pretty busy looking for this plant, I don't have time to help you, Free, but I wish you good luck in your quest to retrieve the necklace, said Thor, nodding to Free. Free seemed to have understood the message and headed for the exit, until he stopped before opening the door. You know maybe if you just help me a little bit to retrieve the necklace, Freja would be very grateful maybe she could even reward you, Thor Free said with an innocent smile. Thor, however, didn't seem to mind, I already told you I'm busy at the moment, maybe I can help you on another quest Free, said Thor, staring at the map and marking a specific spot with Cole. Free was disappointed he could only think. How he has no interest in receiving a reward from my beautiful sister. The way my sister is now, if someone brought the Brisingaman and asked for her hand in marriage, Freja would agree right away. By Odin I need to find this necklace. I can't let my sister get married. I must protect her from those idiots. Free thought indignantly. It was then that Free had an idea of the last resort. You know Thor I can go with you to help look for this plant I may be the god of peace, but what some people don't know, is that I'm also the god of agriculture and good harvest, maybe I can locate free set until he was grabbed by the collar and pulled toward the door by Thor. Let's help your sister. I can't imagine the sadness she must be feeling at the disappearance of her necklace. You said you want to visit Jotunheim, right? What are we waiting for? said Thor, as he grabbed Mjolnir and headed to the door. Free had a small smile of victory. Location. Jotunheim, Winter Castle Castle of Utgard. POV third person. How long should we wait? Asked a Jotun named Scrimmer. Be patient. Our friend advised us to find who will be our greatest threat, when the gods arrive here, we will give them challenges, so that we know their capabilities and limits also, if they fail in the challenges, other races will realize that the gods are not to be followed Bor was a fool to seek peace in a kingdom already stained by the blood of thousands. We only respect strength, because strength is the only thing that prevents other pantheons from invading us, replied Utigard. Do you think Hada knows what we're doing my king? Asked Scrimmer. It's impossible for him to see through these walls I'm sure of that, assured Utgard. Do you think there is anyone dangerous among the gods, my lord? Asked Thrym. Haha <laughs> Hathrim. They are gods but we are one of the oldest races we are personifications. Against gods? It is a fact that during our first war against Esgard, it took, at least, five gods to kill one Jodan, and at that time, we were outnumbered currently, in this castle alone, there are a thousand Jodans, there are no chances for the gods to defeat us in case of another war, said Utgard, smiling. POV Thor. Due to Freja crying over her stolen treasure, I, as the hero of a cliché and I'm, must help the beautiful woman. And then she will fall madly in love with me, and then she will reward me with a kiss. And then we would marry and I would treat her like a queen. Pfff ha 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 I could only laugh at this ridiculous situation. Yeah right Thor? What's so funny? We're on a quest. Said a voice behind me. It was Sif, who was accompanying us. It's nothing Sif I just remembered a joke I explained still smiling. Why is Sif accompanying us? Well it was more of a coincidence, she found us in Jotunheim, as she was looking for an item that is only found in this land, and quite hard to find, an ice rose. She had just located the rose and picked it up when she found us heading towards Utgard's winter castle. When she discovered our destination, she immediately asked to accompany us, Sif had always liked to travel through the lands of the Kingdom of Asgard, this was something she and I had in common. And here we were, three people, two gods, and an Einar jar, heading towards a castle full of giants. 
Sif wanted to call in reinforcements, as we were practically invading hostile territory, this reaction was understandable. Free was well free, like a good god of peace, was so unconcerned with the situation that it impressed me to some extent. After all, he didn't think anything big would happen. But me? Well I didn't really care about our current situation I only had one thing on my mind. I need coffee. I spent a fucking century without coffee. Mead was a good substitute, but I can't drink mead forever, I might end up getting sick of the taste or something. I had a goal. Find a necklace and drag Free to Africa and make him your coffee detector. During our walk, Free looked bored, so he tried to strike up a conversation. Air Thor why are you carrying your forge hammer? Asked Free, pointing to Mjolnir. He thought Mjolnir was a mere forge hammer? Maybe because my partner was sleeping Free didn't feel any energy? Let's just say this hammer isn't just for forging I replied. Speaking of forge I remembered a little detail free I forged this necklace, and I know it had a return rune for the owner, through the blood bond, how did Freja lose? I asked finding the situation strange. I know that my friend, Freja has tested this several times. As soon as she woke up she would activate the rune, and the necklace would appear around her neck every time, but on one particular morning, it didn't work. Freja jumped out of her bed and ran towards the place where she kept the necklace, which was the second drawer of the right closet, and the necklace was gone. Said Free in awe. Is the rune's effect being negated? But does that mean that wait how does he know that? He happens to free you damn siskin stalker. Free you don't stare at your sister all night right? I asked uncertainly, looking at my friend. Who looked outraged? What? Of course not. I would never have such disgusting behavior. I just make a point of waking up 30 minutes earlier than her, and then I keep watching from her bedroom window, so I can watch her waking up, because, it's one of the only times of the day she smiles said free, as if it were the most natural thing in the world. I think I should seriously rethink my friendship's location Winter Castle Utgard Castle. POV third person. Well. That's a big door, said Free in contemplation looking at the castle door. Maybe the Jodans want to make up for the lack of size of something else? Said Sif with a playful smile. Sif then walked to the door and tried to push the gate. Ugh this thing is heavier than it looks a little help would be nice, Sif said, gritting her teeth. It was then that Free tried to help by pushing the gate. Ugh phew maybe maybe it's better we stop for a while Free said tiredly, after failing to open the gate. Free and Sif then walked away from the gate. So what now? Do we call someone? Asked Sif. I don't know Utgard Castle is known to nullify magic of all kinds, due to being made of corrupted ice, and it only responds only to the will of its master who is Utgard, we are not strong enough to open the door, so maybe if we screamed for help, someone inside the castle would hear us. Said Free uncertainly. It was then that they both saw Thor heading towards the gate. Thor then stopped a few feet from the gate and looked up to see the size of the door. And then he reached out his hand to remove the hammer that was clinging to his belt. When Thor had received the Mjolnir along with the note, he noticed that on the back of the note were written two runes, each with its meaning and command. It was these runes that decided the proportions of the Mjolnir Thor received from one above all. Therises, this can mean brute force, this command would make Mjolnir have the same proportions as the Mjolnir from Record of Ragnarok. You, Yuris, this can mean the primary force, this command would make Mjolnir shrink to the same proportions as Marvel's Mjolnir. A bonus was that my Mjolnir responds to my return command, as does Marvel's Mjolnir, even though it is asleep. As soon as Thor took up the hammer he whispered a word. Therises, said Thor. It was then that the golden-colored rune lines of Mjolnir began to emit a small glow, and then the hammer expanded. Free and Sif were surprised by the weapon of unusual proportions. Because they didn't find such a weapon viable, after all, it wasn't a common warhammer. Thor then supported Mjolnir on his right shoulder. And then he lifted his foot knock-knock, Thor said. As soon as Thor had said these words he kicked the doors, and by the force of the blow, the hinges of the gates were broken, and so the ice gates of the castle. Said to be heavier than mountains fell to the ground the inhabitants, not only of the castle but of much of the territory of Jotunheim, could swear they heard a rumble of thunder. Location. Jotunheim inside the Utgard castle. POV third person. 
Hidden in the shadows was a figure covered by a black cloak, that same figure was watching the feet done by Thor at the gates. The shadowy figure wore an undisturbed smile. What an interesting development it just shows that I made the right decision, commented the figure. Location. Jotunheim inside the Utgard Castle POV Thor. As soon as I took the first step inside the castle, I looked back and saw that neither Free nor Sif had moved. Hey don't just stand there, let's go, I said. This seemed to wake them up, as Free soon ran towards me. Thor. What the hell was that? Shouted Free. A few moments ago he wasn't trying to open the gate. Well you guys wanted to come in, I just opened the door, I explained, shrugging. There's more to break the door, Sif muttered. Look, Thor we can't come here and destroy their house. We are invited. Said Free. I could only face Free we weren't guests, the Jodans didn't open the gates and invited us in besides, we can now be seen as invaders. Does that mean Free trailed off as he looked at something behind me? When I turned around I saw several Jodans, about 20, pointing their weapons, swords, and spears at us. Ere he we come in peace? Said Free nervously. Smooth, Free. Smooth it was then that Sif whispered in my direction. Is this the part where they say, you shall not pass? Asked Sif. Thanks for the accidental reference if I needed this. Location. Jotunheim Utgard Castle, Throne Room. POV Thor. The throne room in Utgard Castle was quite different in that not only was the throne there, but several tables and chairs were also in the same room. If you were to compare this room to any other this throne room would be similar to the main hall of Hogwarts Castle. And the one sitting where the headmaster would be, was the Jodan ruler of this castle, Utgard. Apart from this guy, the whole hall was full of Jodans, and some of them were staring at us, or more accurately, were staring at me. Well I feel like Shinjeki no Kaijin so. Beautiful day isn't it? Said Free nervously. Well I suppose it would be normal Free is nervous. After all, we grew up listening to stories of ancient wars, and precisely one of the bloodiest wars was between Asgard and Jotunheim. The reason it was so bloody was that the Aesir gods found a worthy opponent, the Jodans. It took five gods to bring down a Jodan, but it didn't always work, besides that, generally among the five, at least two or three gods died in the process of killing a single Jodan. Hence the Aesir are no longer as numerous as they were in the early days of my grandfather Bor's reign, after so much bloodshed, the Vanner gods surpassed the Aesir in numbers, this made Bor seek immediate peace with the Jodans, because of the growing power of the Vanner. Shortly thereafter a new war broke out between Vanner and Aesir, it was during this war that Odin was born, but it was also during this war that Bor died in battle. And so, after years of conflict, Odin ended the war after Njord relinquished his crown and bent his knee. And so the Vanner gods submitted to the Aesir gods, making Odin their new ruler. At that time, there were only 300 Jodans that fought the Aesir, and about 200 survived the war. But today there are more than 2,000 Jodans, half of which are inside this castle, and therefore they are subordinate to Utgard, and the rest is scattered in the realm of Jodenheim. 1,000 Jodans were inside this castle, and we were just two gods and one Einar jar, maybe I can understand Free's nervousness. Sif seemed considerably calmer, although her hand was already gripping the hilt of her sword, and was always watching for any movement of the Jodans. I think she was thinking that if she was going to go down, she was going to go down fighting. The Jodan who was sitting in the main chair, then stood up and opened his arms. Greetings I am Utgard, ruler of this castle I. Welcome our Asgardian allies to my lands I apologize for the lack of consideration of our reception, I don't want to leave a bad impression. We were just surprised, Utgard said, smiling as he stared at me. What did he expect? An apology? If so, then he's not right in his head. After all, if there was one thing I learned from Odin, it was the stories he told me about my grandfather, Bor, and his war with the Jodans, from the stories. I suspected that this castle is somehow connected to Utgard, every piece of ice, every piece of furniture, every stone, in short, everything that gate back there. It opens according to Utgard's will. If the gate does not open, it means that Utgard supposedly did not want to meet us in other words, this bastard knew we were out there, and watched Sif and Free try to open the gate and fail. I just returned the favor Lord Utgard. 
It's a great honor to meet you, don't worry about the hospitality issue we made mistakes too, and we sincerely apologize for our behavior, Freeze said, looking at me as he spoke the last word. I could only shrug doors can be fixed. I wouldn't have done what I did if he had welcomed us, or at least said something about not being available right now, he just ignored us and left us there, and since I knew he was watching us outside, it's almost certain that he wanted Free and Sif to scream for help to open the gate. The old tactic of showing yourself superior to others early on, so that when it's time to talk, he seems more intimidating and in control of the situation. Humiliate them a little make them ask for help and then reach out your hand, and you'll have them in the palm of your hand. Hurting someone's pride is, in some situations, effective in making them emotionally unstable during a conversation. To make it easier to take advantage of the victim, there is no need to ask forgiveness Prince Free, but I am curious about your arrival at my castle, together with your friends, I wonder, what are you doing so far from Asgard? Asked Utgard. As soon as those words were out of this guy's mouth I could only narrow my eyes. Don't give me that innocent question you bastard your castle might have the ability to nullify the effect of runes if you wish. I just can't blame you because you're not the only one with this one ability, even a box with ceiling runes, can negate the effect of a time-space rune. Ahem well. You see no Utgard, we knew you would be the personification of knowledge, more precisely occult knowledge, I wonder if you could help us in our search for a specific item, said Free smiling in anticipation. Maybe first of all, what would this item be? Asked Utgard. It's my sister's necklace she lost it some time ago, it's very important to her it's irreplaceable. I wonder if you know where it is or at least if you offer any clues Free replied. Surely I could know someone who can help however, while I accept your apology, my subordinates don't seem to accept, said Utgard, pointing to the rest of the Jodans inside the hall. That's when I looked around, and it seemed that most, if not all, of the Jodans, were now staring at us with angry looks. Sif looked ready to draw her sword, but I stopped her by holding her forearm she looked at me, and I shook my head. One of the rules of guest rights if someone attacks you, you have every right to retaliate. This rule is even more important for me and Free, as we were princes, our actions reflect our people. If we strike the first blow, Jodans have the right to defend themselves, and it will show that Asgard does not honor the rights of guests, this could damage our image not only for other races, but also for other pantheons. Fortunately, my race respects strength. So I propose five challenges, and if you complete at least three of these challenges, I will help you in your search for Princess Freja's necklace, but in case you lose two challenges, you will set out on a new quest for us capture a lonely young Jodan who lives in Niflheim on the island of shadows called Lingvi, and bring her here, her mother and Grabota wants her back said Utgard. I really don't want to delay this mission it's already taking up a lot of my time. Niflheim? I've been in this realm when I went to collect some items for Adhuna, like the blood of a draw grug I still remember the smell, it made the smell of leachate seem like a perfume of the highest quality. But Lingvi? I don't remember seeing any of this. I mean, yes, I went further to the center of this realm, and I saw the river of souls, considered the river of reincarnation, called Chio, which divided the ice realm in two, the ice land and the land of the dead and the famous Lake of the Dead, Umsvartner, where the Draugr rose, but I hadn't seen islands. But it seemed that Siv knew about this island, as I saw that she had a look of recognition in her eyes, but she also turned paler than usual. Wait a minute there. Lingvi is a forbidden place. While it may be where this Jodan is, it's also where Fenrir is chained. Exclaimed Sif. Oh. So is that where my cousin is? Hmm. Possibly I'll visit him later maybe I'll even bring him coffee. These are the terms of the pact said Utgard. It looked like Sif didn't want to risk it. I think we'd better go, we can have other ways to locate this necklace, Sif whispered between us. I was about to agree with Sif, until we agree. Said Free. We have a pact then. Said Utgard with a smile. Prince Free with all respect why don't you offer your ass too? Asked Sif impassively. Free looked indignant. Sif. This is total disrespect to me. Furthermore, it may seem like an unfair pact, but the situation is hopeless. I need to find this necklace before another one little shit. If anyone finds it before me, they can ask my sister to marry him and she will accept. 
and then she'll leave me free explained exasperatedly. I'm leaving, if there's one thing I don't like it's people answering for me, I said. Sif seemed to agree with me and then started following me. But we were stopped by two giants who blocked the door to the hall. Get out of my way, do you want to violate the guests' rights? If so I have every right to remove you from my sight, I said, narrowing my eyes. You can't, said the Jaden. And why not? I insisted. At that point, I was already aiming Jolner at this guy's head. Because Prince Free agreed to the pact as we and not I, he basically included you two in the pact as well, Utgard said, smiling. Damn it, Free, you know that we cannot violate a pact, as it is a total disrespect to one of our laws, after all, a pact is Emer's law. When we get that necklace back, you're going to help me a lot more than finding coffee, free. For starters, I'm going to take your Sumarbrander sword and study it, after all, it is one of the most powerful swords in our pantheon, being the only sword that can match Sert's sword, the Skamringsford, which is capable of reducing everything to ashes. Alright. But free, I'll charge you for the extra work I said looking at free. Okay, said free, embarrassed. Location. Jodenheim Utgard Castle, outside, POV Thor. The pact was clear, as Free had the brilliant idea to include both me and Sif, we will need to participate in at least one challenge. The first challenge was simple. A race. Competitors must run from the castle to the nearest mountain and return to the castle. For this challenge, Sif offered herself as a candidate, even though I was much faster than her. However, I chose to remain silent, I wanted to see what Sif had up her sleeve, I knew she wouldn't volunteer without a good reason. Are you sure you want to participate in this Sif challenge? You still have some physical limits, even though you're one of our best Einerjar, said Free. Don't worry, I have something that will help me, Sif said smiling confidently. Now I was curious, what do you have Sif? Sif seemed to notice my curiosity as she smiled in my direction. Don't be so surprised you're not the only one my mom taught me something about forging, Sif said, with a wink. Oh? Now, this got interesting. I see you've already chosen your representative, Prince Free, I want you to meet mine, his name is Yugi, said Utgard with a smile. And so we got away from the competitors, and as soon as we got away they started to prepare. You both are ready? Yugi, give the young Einarjar a small advantage we don't want to break her spirit, said Utgard with a smile. Yugi just showed a positive sign. Thanks to a small amulet, the Jodan has shrunk considerably, it is now six feet tall. To be a fair match. The sound of a trumpet authorized the start of the game. As soon as the trumpet sounded, Sif immediately started running to my surprise, she is much faster than normal. It was then that I noticed that the cape and boots she was wearing, were giving off a small green glow. The cape should be enchanted to reduce air resistance, and the boots would act as boosters to increase speed Sif you cunning woman. Apparently, she's learned a thing or two from her mom, even though she wants to follow in her dad's footsteps. Yes. Go Sif. Bring us the victory. Haha <laughs> applauded Free, who screamed like a good fan. But when I looked at the Jaden who was competing against Sif he hadn't left the starting line, he didn't even seem shaken by Sif's supernatural speed. I must say, I'm impressed, said Utgard in contemplation. As he approached where we were. Haha, ha, she's our best Einerjar, even though she's only 100 years old, Free said with a smug smile. I see it's a shame she's competing against Hugi the Thought, said Utgard, smiling. What did he say? I soon faced the Jada named Hugi again, at the starting line only to find he had disappeared. Oh no Sif, you were unlucky. Location. Jadenheim on the outskirts of Utgard Castle. POV third person. Sif was rapidly approaching the mountainside. This is being too easy said Sif. She then took one last look back but saw no one. She then accelerated again towards the slope. As soon as Sif was just inches from the slope, she was ready to turn around and head back to the castle only for her to freeze, as soon as she turned around. Time seemed to freeze when Sif noticed a shadow beside her she looked and was surprised when she saw the Jaden. Good luck next time kid said the Jada named Hugi with a mocking tone. As soon as Sif blinked, Hugi had disappeared again. She then looked ahead and saw that he was already halfway back to the castle. Sif could only grimace in resignation. Shit, said Sif cursing her luck. Time skip. 
5 minutes, location. Inside Utgard Castle Main Hall, POV Thor. And so, we had our first loss. I'm sorry. For losing the first challenge so soon, my overconfidence prevented me from making the best judgment, and letting you compete first Thor said Sif. I stopped her by reaching out my hand and putting it on her shoulder. Don't think about it too much, both you and we were surprised. But it wasn't all that bad, after all, now I know that you've learned to value your mother's work more, I'm sure that in the future it will be you who will surprise us I said. I wasn't very good at comforting others, but I did my best so she wouldn't feel bad at least I think that was a good lesson for her. But it seemed to work, as she smiled at me in response. The next challenge will be a food competition, said Utgard, pointing to two tables of human proportions. On the tables were two plates full of ribs. The Jodan who used the shrinking amulet was called Logi. And who would compete against him would be free. With the score being 1x0 in favor of the Jodans, a victory in our favor was preferable. Let the competition begin, said Utgard. And then a trumpet sounded in the main hall. But as soon as the trumpet announced the start of the match, Free had been defeated a few seconds later. What I found disgusting and strange, was that Jodan didn't even leave the bones. Ah I see it's another victory for us, it's a pity for you as guardians, said Utgard. What what was that? Asked Free in shock. Don't look me like that, Prince Free Logi is known for his great appetite after all, the personification of fire devours everything in front of him, said Utgard with a smile. This is not going well time skip. 5 minutes. POV third person. As the pact was made under the law of Emer, the result must be respected and honored by both parties, it was one of the laws established by Buri himself, the first Norse god. With a total of 5 challenges. And with a 2-0 score in favor of the Jodans, the Asgardians needed to win the next 3 challenges. No I was a fool we won't get the information Utgard has about the necklace, and besides, we have a new quest to go to the frozen realm of Niflheim, and look for a Jodan that is living on the same island with the murderer of gods. We are doomed. Said Free almost pulling out his hair in despair. It was then that Sif slapped his cheek. Slap, get a grip, my prince. You the one who got us into this situation, so at least keep your composure, Sif said, crossing her arms. Who would participate in the next challenge would be Thor. POV Utgard. Everything was going according to the plan, thanks to my connection with my castle, I was able to record all the competitions. Once we're done with that, I'll send a rune to the other races, and have them see the ones as guardians. Getting them to fetch Ingerboda's daughter was just a bonus. But still there's this boy, who broke down the gates of my castle, it's time to humiliate him a little with something simple. Since I have received information about his taste for mead, I would like to know how he would react to not being able to consume a mere mead horn. I soon brought the ceremonial horn comparing it to a god was even a little funny, due to the difference in size. The drinking horn was easily twice the height of the red-haired boy, who was just over 7-2 feet. The mead will never finish, as the bottom of this horn is connected to a core of a planet far away, and has the size of our sun, made up of almost all water. The only solid thing on that planet is the core that carries the planet's water, and turns into mead for the bottom of this drinking horn. I looked at the god and gave my best smile. Here is your challenge, Asgardian, you will have no competitors this horn serves to punish my men, if someone violates the feast customs, the punishment is to drink from this horn. Your challenge is to dry it very simple, don't you think? I thought it was the better way to give you a chance to win, after all, it wouldn't be fun anymore I said, handing the mead horn into the little hands of the boy, who was standing on the edge of my salon table, so the horn wouldn't hit the ground. For some reason the other two Asgardians, instead of looking insulted looked worried? Strange why does it look like they saw a spirit? POV third person. Let the challenge begin, said Utgard. And then the trumpet sounded in the hall. And so Thor soon turned the giant horn filled with mead and began to drink. Ha ha ha, let's go my people. Let's root for this Asgardian. Said Utgard. All the Jodans knew what that horn was or more specifically, where the bottom of the horn would lead. Then the Jodans exchanged amused smiles and began to encourage Thor. Drink it. 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 
Time skip. Four hours later the main hall was silent. As the first hour passed, the shouts of encouragement began to be replaced by jeers. After two hours, the mockery began to be replaced by calls for surrender. After three hours, the hall stopped making noise and began to stare at Thor, who hadn't lost his consumption pace. After four hours the endless ceremonial horn lay on the ground, but there was not a drop of meat coming out of the horn. This meant that a water planet of the size of the sun had ceased to exist, Thor was now facing Utgard, who looked nervous. It was then that Thor made a sound, a sound that meant a warning in Valhalla during the festivities. Hick the drunk calamity was here. Third person, POV. Utgard's plan was quite simple, to challenge the gods to impossible challenges, use his castle to record the gods' humiliating performance, and send to the other races subordinate to the Aesir gods through runes, and show them their protectors, this would lead to other races being more receptive to joining the Jotuns in their rebellion. It is a fact that races subordinate to the gods are now more insecure with their leader's new form of leadership, not least because the kingdom of Asgard was forged by war. A warrior kingdom, with a leader who now prefers diplomacy over retaliation against other pantheons. Utgard wanted new leadership, a leadership that other pantheons were afraid to face. Odin was still feared right after the war against the Vanir gods. But over the years, some have felt that Odin was getting soft, some races blamed his wife, Frigg, others thought that when Odin drank from the waters of Mimisbrunner, he now preferred more dialogue than fighting. More than one thing was certain in Utgard's mind. The other pantheons are not afraid of the Nordic pantheon. And that is a mistake. Nice words do not stop others from invading the Nordic territory. What prevents other pantheons from invading is something simple. Cruelty. The cruelty of the Aesir gods was legendary during wars. And this, the leaders of some races respected. Unlike Odin, the leaders respect only one thing. Strength. Without strength, you don't keep the leaders together. And as Odin no longer demonstrates his strength, the other races began to feel insecure, and Utgard would seize that chance. The challenges were intended to show the weakness of the future leader of the Aesir's closest allies, ironically it was the last race to submit to the Aesir. The Vanir gods. Utgard knew how much Prince Free loved his sister, so he made Free a target. Having one of Odin's bastard sons humiliated was also a bonus. Or at least that's what Utgard initially thought. Hick hey bring me more said Thor. More? Asked Utgard confused. Yes. Hick bring me more mead. Thor said with a smile. Now Utgard was in disbelief. He's just done the impossible of depleting a planet of mead and still wants more? I I would like to finish the challenges first only then can I deliver more mead said Utgard. Mull right Hick but I hope I get the same amount of meat after these challenges are over, if not said Thor. Now Utgard looked upset. After all it looked like Thor had threatened him. Was that a threat, Prince Thor? Under my roof, and the guest law? Asked Utgard. Automatically, most of the Jotuns were taking up their weapons. At the same time, Free and Sif began to get nervous. Threaten? Hick oh no, I don't make threats Thor said smiling. The Jotun seemed to have calmed down and began to drop their weapons. Until Thor continued to speak Hick I make promises though said Thor. As soon as Thor said these words the majority of the Jotuns again grabbed their weapons and were ready to fight. But Utgard raised a hand, and the Jotun stopped. While Utgard wouldn't mind breaking guest law and killing the Asgardians, there was one small problem. He wanted to bring other races into his rebellion and violating guest law would not be ideal for Utgard's plans. Anyone who violates the guest law will be marked for life as someone unreliable, being ostracized. Certainly Prince Thor, shall we go to the next challenge? Asked Utgard through gritted teeth. Time skip. Five minutes. Third person, POV. Your next challenge will be lift this house cat, said Utgard. The cat, of the Norwegian forest breed, had its fur gray color, and its eyes were amber. For some reason Sif didn't feel comfortable with this cat. This is no ordinary cat, whispered Sif to Free. Why do you think that? Asked Free confused. The previous challenge was not normal, you and I faced specific personifications for our challenges, I even understand that we lost fairly, but what about Thor's first challenge? That horn had more me than it looked. 
That cat, it can't be a simple cat, replied Sif. As Sif thought about the giant cat, she was interrupted by Utgard's voice. Your challenge is simple Asgardian lift the cat off the ground, said Utgard. Hick okay, said Thor. Thor then addressed the cat, who was much bigger than he was. The cat just looked at Thor. And when Thor was inches from the cat, he held up his hand. You know I never liked cats Hick so we can do it the easy way or the hard way, said Thor. The cat just looked at Thor and hissed. Okay then I was hoping it was the hard way, Thor said, as he cracked his knuckles. The cat just hissed until Thor slapped it silent, surprising the Jotuns once more. Slap Hick respect my authority, said Thor, as he hit the cat a few more times. After a good spanking, the cat found itself in Thor's hands being lifted off the ground. The vision looked like a man lifting a cat of the size of an elephant. Hick let's get on with it. I want my mead, said Thor, dropping the cat. As soon as the cat fell to the ground he started running out of the castle as fast as possible. For Utgard this was a feat no one could have done. After all the cat was another son of Ingerboda his name was Jormungandr, Midgardsirmer himself in disguise. Seeing that Thor managed to tie the score made both Sif and Free happy. But it made Utgard hesitate to go on with the next challenge. At this time Utgard was contemplating killing the Asgardians and continuing his rebellion without the support of other races, there was only one more challenge left, it would be the tiebreaker. After some consideration Utgard smiled. He knew exactly which challenge would be perfect to humiliate Odin's son. I must say I am impressed, Prince Thor. As the last challenge will be something definitive, it is only fair that it is a competition of strength, said Utgard. Oh. He gay fight? All right then, said Thor. It was then that a person the size of Sif six feet approached Thor. It was an old lady. Huh? Hick Thor was confused. Would he have to fight an old lady? Don't underestimate her, son of Odin. No man or woman has been able to defeat Ellie. In fact, I don't think anyone can beat her in the test of strength, she remains undefeated, explained Utgard with a smile. Free looked confused. How could an old lady never be defeated in a test of strength? Sif wasn't looking at the old woman or Utgard she was looking at the other Jodans in the ballroom, who wore a Victoria smile. Something is not right, Sif said to herself. Thor just stared at the old woman. Well let's go then, Thor said. Time skip. Five minutes. The field was defined, a circle on the ground would serve as a fighting ring. Let the challenge begin, said Utgard. The sound of a trumpet echoed through the hall. Soon Ellie leaped toward Thor. And then she grabbed Thor's arms, no matter how ridiculous the situation Sif realized that the old woman was managing to dominate Thor. You are the strongest guy I know Thor. Show this old woman what you're capable of. Shouted Free, rooting for his friend. Hick shut up Free. When this is over I'll make you cry blood. Said Thor turning his head to face Free. This seemed to make Free worried about his future. Come on Thor. Don't you dare lose. Shouted Sif worriedly, trying to cheer for her longtime friend. She knew of Thor's absurd strength, but she didn't know how a simple old woman had such strength. What personification was she? Fortunately, Utgard answered her question. Ha 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 I'm sorry to disappoint you Asgardians. But it looks like you won't get the information I have. Nobody can beat old age. Even if you can't die of old age thanks to Iden's apples, you will never be able to stop it, it's inevitable. You can't stop time. As soon as Utgard talked about stopping time, Thor soon thought of one of his techniques. Just to remember that Utgard is cancelling the use of magic inside the castle through the corrupted ice. So he would have to win the traditional way. Meanwhile, the Jodans mocked Thor's plight. Give up Asgardian. You see how superior our race is? Apparently you Asgardians will have to look elsewhere for Brisingaman. Ha 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 all the Jodans started to laugh. Well there's only one thing left to do hick maximum effort. Said Thor. Thor then took hold of the old woman's arms and fell backward performing a backward roll. Due to the old lady being held, she ended up unsteady forward and then, in the short space of time Ellie was falling. Thor placed his foot at the height of the old lady's waist, and applied pressure as he rolled onto his own back. The result? Ellie was thrown out of the bounded area. Meaning the defeat of old age. As well as the Asgardian victory over the Jodans. Yeah. 
shouted Siv and Frias there and towards Thor, who was rising from the ground. Hick few now it's time for the sweet nectar. Give me my meat now. Said Thor, holding out his hand, facing Utgard who was in shock. Sif lunged and then hugged Thor, while Free walked over and patted his shoulder. Ha! Huh? Hick hey let go of me, Thor said, looking at Sif. You drunk idiot! Said Sif smiling. Thor then grabbed Sif by the collar and flung her over his shoulder. Free then proceeded to speak. I'm glad you win Thor. Now we can finally get the information about my sister's necklace and get out of here. Free said with a smile. Thor just smiled. Do you think Hick I forgot what I said about what I was going to do to you? Thor said looking at Free. Gulbear not in the face? Asked Free nervously. Hick yes in the face, Thor said smiling. Then Thor punched Free in the face making him fly towards a castle wall. Free collided with the wall creating cracks, he had a broken nose, was missing a few teeth, and appeared to have been knocked out. Well Hick that was just the beginning, but before continuing with Free's punishment, I need to resolve one thing first, Sif go get Free off the wall, said Thor looking at Sif. As Sif walked towards Free, Thor then faced Utgard. It's here, isn't it? Thor asked, narrowing his eyes. What? Asked Utgard. Don't make a fool of yourself Hick your castle is one of the few things that can negate the effect of magic. While it's true that it may be something else I'm denying, I found your challenges strange Hick Thor said smiling. I don't know what you're talking about, said Utgard. Oh? Hick let me clarify then, all of your challenges were inside your castle, although they could have been done outside right after Sif and Yugi's run, said Thor. Even if that's the case, it could just be a coincidence. Besides, as you said yourself, the race was outside of my castle, said Utgard. Yeah Hick but. Those runes in the trees were pretty suspicious said Thor. Utgard froze. The four challenges were inside the castle because of the need to record the challenges and send them to the leaders of the other races. Unfortunately, the first challenge was a race, it was out of bounds for the castle's event recording ability. So Utgard spread runes along the way, he didn't think anyone would notice as they were the size of a leaf, the runes would function as a kind of extension of his castle. The Jodan started to get nervous. What would be my motivation for doing such a thing then? Asked Utgard. Hick I don't care about things like motivation the act itself is damning. But I want Frage's necklace, I've already come this far and made the pact, it's time for you to honor it or would you rather be called an oathbreaker? Said Thor. Utgard narrowed his eyes but began to respond. Very well I know of someone who might know where the necklace is, until he was interrupted by Thor. Wasn't that clear? Hick. I said I want the necklace I know it's with you, or at least you know who stole it, Thor said, narrowing his eyes. I have no way of knowing such information. Said Utgard, rising from his throne. As soon as Utgard rose, the other Jodans began to pick up their weapons. Hick are you sure? Frage's necklace was recently stolen, but it was also recently created, just a few people knew the name it was given to the necklace, so tell me Utgard, during my fight against the old lady, how one of your subordinates knew the name of the necklace. Said Thor. This can be easily explained it has been a few months since Frager received the necklace, the name is already known, explained Utgard. Mhik so why didn't you call it by its name at first? Thor asked. Now Thor, drunk as he was, knew his questions were only suspicious, he could not blame Utgard of the theft. But the Jodan's behavior remained suspect. To begin, all the Jodans were heavily armed in the main hall of the castle. Utgard scattered runes in the challenge, which Thor noticed were convergence runes pointing towards the castle, signifying a kind of extension of the castle. Thor knew that there were certain incidents and disagreements over the years between Asgard and Jodenheim. Thor was already upset by this futile quest, and everything the Jodans had been doing so far in recent years, only pointed to one thing rebellion. At the time, it looked like only the Jodans were wanting this rebellion, but if the Jodans start, other races might join. The problem with all this is that if Asgard has a new internal war, it is likely that the closest pantheons, like the Slav pantheon that had a rivalry against the Nordic pantheon, will see this as an opportunity to take over territories. What Thor was doing now was voicing his suspicions openly until he found a fool. And end this future rebellion in the most practical way. 
Kill the idiots who want to make war. And who are these idiots? The inhabitants of the castle of Utgard, but, owing to guest law, Thor must wait for some fool to show up. And make the fool violate guest law. Enough. Yelled a random Jotun getting up from the chair, which was next to a Hugi. Apparently, the fool appeared. You come here, destroy the gates of our house. Threaten our king. Accuses him without concrete evidence. And do you expect us to stand here? I'm tired of Asgardian arrogance," said Jotun. Utgard then motioned to Hugi. Hugi understood the signal and grabbed the Jotun and pulled him to his seat again. The Jotun reluctantly obeyed. However, to his misfortune Thor had targeted him. I apologize for my subordinate he has a bit of a grudge against Asgard, old blood. But one thing he's right, you're treating an ally in a hostile way. Are you going to accuse the other races of stealing Frages Bersingaman as well? Explained Utgard. Thor didn't immediately respond, just jumped up onto the table and started walking. Maybe I might have exaggerated said Thor, walking towards the Jodan who had shouted. Then Thor stepped in front of Jodan. Out of curiosity why do you hate the Asgardians? Thor asked. Before Hugi could stop his partner, the Jodan spoke. You took my son from me. Blood for blood, this is our law, Asgardian, said the Jodan facing Thor, under the table, the Jodan was gripping the hilt of a hammer. As soon as Jodan responded, the tension was palpable. Hume Hick understandable, Thor said, turning away. It looked like it would end at this point but Hick you know there was a story my father, Odin, told me about a battle of my grandfather Bor. He said that a young Jodan blindly ran into a trap and died begging mercy tell me, was it your son? said Thor looking at Jodan. As soon as Thor had finished speaking, Hel derailed in the ballroom of Utgard Castle. Everything happened so fast. The Jodan raised the hammer and attacked Thor. Bam the hammer hit Thor on the table and shattered it. Thor. Sif yelled. Sigh well. It wasn't exactly what I wanted, but I don't think I can take this farce anymore. Hugi. Let the rest of the men know we're going to Asgard, said Utgard. Since the law of the guest was violated by the Jodans, other leaders, probably, will not join the rebellion. Utgard then assumed it had to be the hard way. Kill the Asgardians without help from the other races, and then make the other races submit to the new government. Kill the Einar Jar and capture Prince Free, I want to know Asgard's defenses first, once I find out, I will send his head as a gift in Jord, said Utgard. The Jodans then looked at Sif who had her sword unsheathed in her right hand, and holding Free's body with her left hand. The Jodans could only scoff, as the Einar Jar would still try to resist, even though she knew she had no chance of surviving. Come here, girl maybe we can have some fun before killing you, said a Jodan approaching with a smile. Sif just spat on the ground. I'm sorry to disappoint you, I'd rather cut my throat than participate in this fun, you're really not my type, replied Sif. Jodan then grimaced, but he didn't stop smiling. Oh. And what's your type then? Maybe I'll kill them in Asgard and then feed you with their meat, asked Jodan. It was then that Sif noticed a small movement on the broken table. And then she smiled. I've always had a thing for redeeds, Sif said. As soon as Sif responded, a scream of pain resounded in the hall. I erg. Everyone looked towards the scream. It was Yugi. He was lying on the floor his leg seemed to be broken in two different places, at the knee, and the ankle. Hick first rule when facing someone fast aim for the legs first someone said. It was Thor, who was walking slowly towards Hugi's head. When Thor got close, he then looked into Hugi's eyes. Just then aim for the head, Thor said, raising his fist. Then Thor punched Hugi in the head. As soon as the fist made contact with Hugi's face, the head exploded. And so. Hugi was the first Jodan to die after centuries after the last war. And Thor was the first god to kill a Jodan alone. Thor then walked towards Mjolnir. No one made a move as they were still processing what had happened. Thor then grabbed the Mjolnir and walked towards Sif and Free. Ignoring the looks the Jodans were giving him. Hick Sif this seemed to wake up Sif. Take Free and get out of here use your new boots and cape to run faster, Thor said. Wait a minute. I won't leave you here said Sif. It wasn't a request, Thor said, looking into Sif's eyes. Sif was silent and looked at Hugi's body on the ground, then at Free. And then she looked at Thor again. Even if you want me to leave we are surrounded said Sif, 
pointing to the rest of the Jotuns, who were hesitating to take the first step, because they were facing Thor. He no problem Thor replied with a smile. Thor then looked at Utgard who was in shock. Hey, he thanks. For violating the guests' rights first said Thor. As soon as Thor finished speaking, he slammed them Jolner into the wall, creating cracks. The wall of the ballroom soon gave way and showed the castle gates, which were still in the ground. This seemed to wake up the Jotuns. Kill them. Kill them now. Shouted Utgard, picking up his warhammer. Sif just looked at Thor. I promise to bring reinforcements, Sif said seriously before grabbing a princess style free and running out of the castle. As soon as Sif passed through the gate, Thor turned towards the Jotuns who were only a few meters away. Ah, Sif hik I am the reinforcement, said Thor with a manic smile, holding up them Jolner. Location. Jotunheim outside the Utgard castle Sif and free. Third personal POV. As soon as Sif left the castle, she quickly formed a transport rune, with her destination being an island in Midgard or Midgard, where there was at the door to Asbru, the bridge of the Aesir, also known as Bilrist. Before Sif goes through the portal, she hears the sound. Boom and then the earth shook. Sif decided not to waste any more time and go through the portal. Location. Midgard or Midgard Future Island Svalbard. A portal opened and Sif carrying free exited it. She then ran towards a rune circle on the ground, which was located in the center of the island. Heimdallr! shouted Sif looking at the sky. A barrier then rose and a rainbow-colored light descended from the sky and hit the rune. When the glow was gone Sif and Free were gone. Location. The kingdom of Asgard Himinjurg, home of Heimdallr. Sif, carrying Free, appeared after a glow about a rune, by this time they were on the highest mountain in Asgard. Sif! What is happening? Asked Heimdallr, the only guard on the Aesir Bridge, responsible for blowing the trumpet, the Jallarhorn, when the Ragnarok happens, and that according to the prophecy, the sound that Jallarhorn will make will be heard by all nine realms. We do not have time. I need to tell King Odin. Said Sif. Warn about what? Asked Heimdallr exasperated. Sif just said one word. War location. Jotunheim Utgard Castle. Third person. POV. While Sif may have looked worried someone was having fun. Ha 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 ha. He keep coming Jotuns. Come on. Ha ha ha, roared Thor in defiance. Thor leaped towards the nearest Jotun and hammered its head, causing the head to explode. Blood stained the floor and walls of the Utgard Castle's ballroom, bodies of Jotuns, or what was left of them, were strewn on the ground. Thor then landed on a table and raised his hammer to block an axe. You are not leaving here alive as guardian. Said the axe user, it was Logi. Hik I'll leave but you won't be there to see me come out of this pile of rubble. Thor replied. Thor then applied pressure to Mjolnir and thrust the axe, then leaped towards Logi's head. Snap that was the noise Logi's neck made when Thor kicked him. Logi's body then fell to the ground. Body number 66 Hik who is next? Said Thor, smiling. And then other Jodans ran towards Thor. Neither Thor nor the Jotuns noticed that Thor's back, from time to time, emitted a red glow. And so Thor fought, bathing in the blood of the Jotuns. Until after a while Thor then blocked a warhammer with Mjolnir. You. You destroyed everything. It was Utgard, who had the hammer, and by the face he was quite irritated. Huh? Hick are you going to cry? Thor asked, with a mocking smile. Thor had been fighting traditionally for some time now, just using Jolner and his strength. During the fight, Thor was looking for a single person. The person? It was the Jodan who was controlling this castle to deny any kind of magic, and this Jodan was now in front of Thor. I have Hick to thank for saving me the time to look for you, Thor said. Thor then pushed Utgard's hammer using Jolner. Utgard then backed away and was ready to strike Thor again. Until the Mjolnir hit Utgard's head, causing it to explode. The Mjolnir then stopped in mid-air and remained afloat, until it returned towards Thor's hands. Now the Jodans got nervous with the death of Utgard, the castle no longer had the effect of nullifying magic. As soon as Thor grabbed the Mjolnir, lightning began to form around him. So Thor imbued his divine power in the form of lightning into Mjolnir, and then it looked like he fell backward, until he stopped his fall, and there he remained with his back arched downward. Thor then looked at the nearest Jotun. 
It was Scrimmer he was missing his left arm and was using a spear to support himself as his right leg was broken. Mercy, said Scrimmer fearfully. Pick no mercy. Thor replied. Thor then attacked. Boom the earth then shook and the roar of thunder resounded in Jotunheim. Location. Asgard Palace. POV. Third person. It was already night in Asgard, in the royal room Odin found himself resting in his bed after a long day. Ah. What's just missing now is my beloved wife, I just hope your meeting with the Queen of the Light Elves is brief hmm. I just hope the Queen of the Elves is as healthy as ever said Odin, with a small, degenerate smile. However, the quiet moment was interrupted by someone entering the room. It was Tur, commander of the Asgardian army. My king. Said Tur. Ah. Odin shouted as he jumped from the bed. Odin then noticed Tur. Tur what is it now? Can't you see I'm on my break? Asked Odin regretfully. Air as I understand you, my king it's something important, said Tur. So tell me, what can be so important that you walk into my room at my rest time? Asked Odin. For a moment, Tur was hesitating to respond, perhaps it would be better. You accompany me? Insisted Tur uncertainly. Odin was confused. How difficult was it to report the news? Time skip. 10 minutes. Location. Asgard Palace Throne Room. As soon as some gods gathered in the throne room, everyone was waiting for one person's word. So what is so important Sif? Said Odin. Beside him was Frigg, who had quickly returned from her diplomatic meeting with the leader of the elves of Alfheim, having been notified of an emergency meeting. There were also some gods Vanner and Aesir in the throne room. Everyone looked at one person. Sif. And she looked nervous since as soon as she returned to Asgard, she took free to the healing chamber and headed to the palace to tell her about her mission in Jotunheim or at least, her failure. She met the goddess Freja, who immediately asked what had happened to her brother. Sif, however, only replied that she needed to gather her parents in the throne room. Ahem. I met Prince Free and Prince Thor in Jotunheim during my mission, and out of curiosity I asked them what they were doing there and they replied that they were heading towards the castle of Utgard, as soon as Sif uttered those words, Frigg immediately interrupted her. What? shouted Frigg. My love while I understand your shock, let Sif finish said Odin. While this seemed to silence Frigg, she didn't seem calm. You can go on Sif tell us what happened said Odin, gesturing with his hand. Well when I found out where they were going, I asked them to call in backup, due to Jodin's hostile behavior over the last few years, but they wouldn't listen. Free said nothing would happen as we were allies, and Thor told me not to worry so much, Sif said. Free is going to take a good beating from me when he wakes up, Scotty said, whispering to her husband, Njord, who was beside her. Freja was also close to them, but she wore a face that showed concern. So when we arrived at the castle, and so Sif continued to tell her story. While Sif was reporting the current situation to the gods, someone was taking on the role of population control. Location. Jotunheim Utgard Castle Main Hall Corridor. Third person POVA group of Jodans was running towards the main hall. The Jodan who was leading the small group of 20 Jodans began to speak. Let's go. He's just a man. Don't be afraid of Amir Eser. He was then interrupted by a bolt of lightning that struck his face and pierced his skull. The rest of the group of Jodans then froze and looked towards the source of the lightning, and they saw a frightening sight. It was Thor, in clothes stained with blood red, walking towards them and dragging them Jolner on the ground. Hick body number 275 or is it 276? Hick. I lost the count said Thor, while sighing. Then Thor looked at the group of Jodans and smiled. Hey hello who wants to be the next number? Thor asked with an innocent tone, but his smile was disturbing. As soon as Thor finished this question, some of the Jodans in the group got nervous and started to retreat in their steps. Huh? Hey no volunteers? All right, I'll decide for you then. Said Thor. As soon as Thor finished speaking, he ran towards the group. Location. Jodenheim Utgard Castle Castle's inner courtyard. Stay together. And remember, don't attack blindly alone. Said a Jodan. In the courtyard of the castle, opposite the main hall, a large number of Jodans, approximately 500, were being gathered, with half of them wielding bows and arrows. 
The Jotun who was leading them was called Fulstag, and he was one of the survivors from the main hall. When Thor started killing his comrades like it was nothing. He ran towards the courtyard in search of reinforcements without anyone noticing. The irony was that Fulstag was known as the personification of courage. But in that particular situation even the bravest was afraid of death. Before he gave any more orders the doors to the hall of the main hall were opened, or rather pushed by a Jodan who flew out of the corridor. This Jodan was without his head. As soon as the 500 Jodans in the courtyard noticed this, they pointed their weapons towards the corridor. Nobody dared to make a noise. Until the sounds of footsteps, which seemed to be made of iron, echoed. A small figure began to appear, this figure had long hair the color of blood, and his clothes, once white they were stained red. No Jodan made a single move, it seemed that everyone had stopped breathing. When Falstag realized this, he knew he must do something, because when despair rules an army defeat is inevitable. You will pay for what you did as guardian, blood for blood. You will die here, I swear this. Said the Jodan called Falstag. Thor just stared at him before answering. Hick. You're not the first Jodan to threaten me with those words, but maybe I'll make you the last, Thor replied. Falstag was nervous, as were the rest of the Jodans. But soon, Falstag wasted no time and began the attack. I am Falstag the personification of courage. I am not afraid of you. Jodans. Charge. Shouted Falstag. Then 250 Jodans fired arrows, while the other 250 joined Falstag on the offensive. Hick then you'll die braver than most, said Thor, with a smile. Thor then raised them Jolner, and lightning began to form around him. Location. Asgard Palace throne room. Did you leave my son there? Shouted someone. It was Frigg who had received news from Sif, that she had fled carrying free, but had left Thor behind in Utgard Castle. While most of the gods were in shock at the news that Thor had managed to kill one Jodan alone, Frigg was more concerned about what came next. Thor stood alone in a castle full of Jodans. Sif then knelt. I beg your pardon, my queen. But it was the orders Prince Thor gave me, Sif replied, bowing. That's not an excuse. Are you an Einar Jar what's your code when you're in a fight? Say it. Questioned Frigg angrily. Until the last breath Sif replied, lowering her head further in shame. When Frigg looked like she was going to say more, Odin cut her off. Enough, words will not change the situation, said Odin. Frigg was silent, but her anger was still noticeable. Odin then turned to face her. How much time do you need? Asked Odin. It seemed that everyone in the throne room knew what Odin was asking her. the question was. How soon can you prepare our army to be ready to march? The intention was clear. Asgard would go to war again. Time skip. 8 hours. Location. Jotunheim close to Utgard Castle. The Asgardian army consisted of 5,000 Dinar Jar, 1,000 Light Elves, 1,000 Dark Elves, 700 Dwarves as Siege Weapons Builders, 500 Trolls, 200 Huldras as Healers, 200 Fasegrimen, 50 Banner Gods, and the 6 Valkyries, all led by 50 Aesir Gods, with Odin being the main leader in battle. The few gods were due to the latest wars for supremacy, which ended much of the Aesir and Vanner bloodline. Many felt that the fight was lost long before it even started, due to the fame of the Jodans, and their current large numbers, compared to the last war. It was almost certain that the Jodans would win, as not even the Aesir or the Vanner could go toe-to-toe -to -toe against the Jodans. Everyone feared the coming battle. There was a storm in Jodenheim, and it was very dark, but it would soon be dawn. Then the army marched to Utgard Castle, when they got close enough, the storm eased as the sun began to peek over the horizon. The vision that the Asgardian army faced, would go down in the history of the Norse pantheon. Thor, son of Odin, sat on a severed head of a Jodan, and around him were piles of bodies bloodstained the walls and floor of the once dreaded Utgard's winter castle, which was now so damaged internally that it looked like a pile of rubble. Thor was smeared from head to toe with blood, as was his giant warhammer, the Mjolnir. But the biggest surprise was the countenance of Thor. It looked like he was bored? It was then that Thor sensed he was being watched, and he turned toward their gaze. When Thor realized it was Odin's army he smiled. Ah! Hick you guys took too long. At that time, Thor received a few more titles by other races, like. The Nightmare of Giants. The Bloodthirsty Drunkard. 
The Calamity of Jotunheim were some of the titles, but there was one title that became a reference, not only for the Nordic pantheon, but also for the other pantheons. The Strongest Norse God. Time skip. One year. Location. Asgard. POV. Third person. A year has passed since Thor's exploit in Jotunheim. All Norsemen of all races knew who was Thor, he was most recognized for his insane strength. As well as his appetite for mead. The strongest Norse god. One Asgardian claimed this title. The god who ended a war before even it started. A war without a single casualty for the Asgardian army. This, of course, attracted the attention of certain people from other pantheons as well. After all, it's not every day that a single Aesir god, a race already recognized for their strength, managed to kill 1,000 Jotuns, a race recognized for their power due to being personifications of course, this didn't distract Thor from his main objective, once they found Freyja's necklace, which was inside the main chambers of Utgard Castle, Thor grabbed free and dragged him to Africa. It took three months, but Thor found the precious in Ethiopia. Coffee acquired. Anyway, as soon as Thor returned from Africa he locked himself in his house, still in Midgard, and began to focus on his projects. His first project was a training room, which was intended to remain hidden from prying eyes. Where he could train quietly. But then, after nearly a year, Thor turned his thoughts to his visit to Jotunheim, and the disappearance of Freyja's necklace. This was since Odin recently began to reconcile with the remaining Jotuns. And so Thor began to consider all the possibilities until after a few weeks of reflecting on what had happened, he found out what happened, and he didn't like it one bit. This was because Thor had only one thing in mind, after many considerations and coincidences during his visit to Jotunheim, he concluded he was a piece of the board. Yes, the Jotuns wanted war, and of course, Thor would not let them destroy Asgard as it was his new home, but he did not fight on his terms. So here was Thor, after a few weeks of investigation, in front of the room of the king and queen of Asgard, as soon as Thor entered the throne room, he saw his mother Frigg and his father Odin, and they soon became aware of his presence. Ah! Thor! Have you come to visit us, my son? Asked his surprised but still smiling Frigg. Thor, however didn't smile. Almost that, mom I'll talk to you later I'd like to spend time with dad, Thor said, glaring at Odin. Odin had an unchanging countenance. Frigg seemed to understand the atmosphere, so she replied. Right have the decency not to do this in the throne room, please it will be difficult to get the blood off the floor, said Frigg, as she left the throne room. As soon as Frigg said that, the six Valkyries that were present in the throne room split. The younger Valkyries accompanied the queen, while the three older ones remained in the throne room, and they were nervously glaring at King Odin and Prince Thor. Because they knew that if these two fought they couldn't do much, and someone could get hurt or worse. Only then did Odin speak. How about we spend some father-son time? Asked Odin smiling. Thor still showed no smile. Fine let's go fishing in Midgard bring Uncle Loki too, said Thor, leaving the room. The Valkyries seemed to calm down before Thor stopped at the door to the room. And old man don't be late said Thor, turning his head to face Odin. Time skip. Two hours. Location. Midgard Atlantic Ocean coast of future Norway. In a small autonomous draker, which Thor had built as a model for his future flying ship, there were three people. They were Prince Thor, the king and leader of the Norse pantheon, the god Odin, and last but not least, Odin's oath brother Loki. All three were sitting on small benches and were fishing with a red-colored fishing line. They had been fishing for an hour Thor still had spoken a single word, neither to Odin nor to his uncle. And that made Odin a little worried so, to start the conversation, he decided to talk. A very interesting draker my son it will be great for when you have your wife, and take her sailing besides other things of course, said Odin with a smile. Thor didn't answer and just kept fishing, until he suddenly pulled out his fishing line, and a fish, Skray, jumped out of the water, and Thor then grabbed it with one of his hands. Odin then spoke again as Thor removed the hook from the fish. It's a pretty big scray, this fishing line must be really strong, Odin said again. Just then Loki spoke too, I think it's enough brother. I know the look of someone angry, said Loki looking at Thor. 
At last someone started talking seriously, said Thor, as he dropped the fish and threw the fishing line overboard again. Odin then sighed. Sigh what do you want me to say? Asked Odin. Well maybe from the beginning how did you steal Freyja's necklace? Said Thor, still watching the line. I don't began Odin. But Thor interrupted. You may not have stolen directly, but you're still an accomplice, aren't you? Thor asked. Odin stopped talking. How much do you know? Asked Odin. Oh I'm not sure maybe even the part where you use me as your butcher of Jodin's. Thor asked, with a tone of sarcasm. Thor it's not what it looks like, you see began Odin until he was interrupted again. Don't give me it's not what it looks like it's the first excuse someone gives when they're discovered lying, Thor said in a mocking tone. He has a point, said Loki, looking at Odin. Sigh very well I used a suppression rune and sent Hugin, who had just returned from Muspelheim. My crows are almost undetectable already, but with a suppression rune? It's like they're not even there, explained Odin. Um I'll remember that detail, now tell me how did you establish contact with the Jodans, so that they could take Freyja's necklace? Thor asked, noticing that he had caught another fish. That was my job said Loki. Thor then looked at his uncle and stared at him. Just your work? Are you going to tell me you didn't have any more participation? Thor asked, in a knowing tone. Okay, it was my idea Odin would sometimes watch your training from the Lidskiff, and he told me of your strength, and how powerful you were becoming due to the possible treachery of the Jodans, I thought, it was the best way to end this war without victims. You were the answer explained Loki. You betrayed your race said Thor in an accusing tone. Yes and after my mother and father abandoned me for being weak in physical strength, I would betray them again without a second thought said Loki. But then a question popped into Loki's mind Thor had asked Odin to call him for this fishing, but that meant Thor knew of his participation. How did you know of my participation? Asked Loki. When I turned 50, my mother Freyd commented that I was already of marriageable age at one point, she commented about your first marriage to a Jodan, and from that marriage, three children emerged said Thor. Yes her name was Ingerboda initially, we loved each other, but let's just say we had different goals, you found out the moment Utgard spoke her name, didn't you? Asked Loki. Honestly, I didn't remember her name until Utgard mentioned her during the pact, and after I killed the 1000 Jodans in the castle, I realized that one was missing. It could be any Jodan, but when I killed Utgard, I erected a barrier so as not to let anyone escape only someone who left the castle before I raised the barrier could have survived, said Thor, looking at Loki. It felt like a question was asked. Yes, I took her from there she is now in another village of Jodans. She wasn't a warrior, she was just allied with Utgard because she wanted her other children back explained Loki. Fenrir and the Jodan of Niflheim, isn't it? Thor asked. Yes, the Jodan's name is Hel she is the youngest replied Loki, with a small smile. Well I'd like to know more about my cousins. I think it's more than clear that I've been manipulated into being your private butcher, right? Asked Thor, now looking at Odin. I didn't want to do this to you, Thor but I saw an opportunity to end a war long before it started, and so I took it I just hope you understand my position but how you found out. Explained Odin. Oh. I understand. I found out when I talked to Sif, she said that when she arrived in Asgard, having fled from Jotunheim, and reported what had happened she told me that you were the only one from the throne room, that had a calm countenance, said Thor, as he pulled his fishing line, which seemed to be pulling something heavy something very heavy. Thor then rose to his feet and placed his foot on the edge of the draker for support as he pulled. But I still don't like being played said Thor. As soon as Thor finished speaking, he gave one last hug. It was then that the head of a serpent emerged from the sea. And in his mouth was the hook. I finally found you, Thor said, with a smile. Odin and Loki recognized the creature, how could they not? It was Jormungandr himself, the Midgard Sermer, known as one of the dragon kings of the supernatural, and the second son of Loki. But while Odin and Loki recognized the dragon, Jormungandr also recognized the passengers of the Draker the first person he recognized as his father. The second was the king of Asgard and his father's brother. And the third was the drunk freak who slapped him in the face when he was in Jotunheim months ago. As soon as Jormungandr recognized the third face, he soon plunged back into the cold sea of Midgard, 
trying to get away from Thor. Only for Thor to start pulling the fishing line again, which was surprisingly holding up the tug of war. Where do you think you going Kausen? You will give me the poison that surpasses the poison of a hydra as a gift. So don't be shy. Shouted Thor, laughing. Thor. You're hurting him. Shouted Loki, worried about his son. It's just a scratch, Thor yelled back. Let him go, Thor. He's going to sink the Draker. Shouted Odin. This Draker won't sink even if a planet were on top of it. I created a new rune, and what it does is simple always at sea level, said Thor pointing to the pole, which had a rune that glowed light blue. But Odin was more concerned about Ragnarok's prophecy, the prophecy said that Thor and Jormungandr would face each other during Ragnarok. Odin could not allow Ragnarok to happen sooner. He had to stop Thor's encounter with the worlds, then he reached out his hand and summoned his spear, the Gunner, and hurled it toward the fishing line Thor was holding. Gunnar was well known in the Nordic pantheon, and it had several functions, but there was one function that was the best known among all others. The spear that never misses a target. While the spear hit the line the fishing line didn't break. Thor. What is this line made of? Asked Odin. Ha ha ha. During my last search near the territory of the Yoruba pantheon, I encountered a very peculiar creature. The locals called it Groot slang, but I called it raw material shouted Thor, laughing, as he pulled on the fishing line. That last part worried Loki a little. What are you going to do with my son? Asked Loki. If my cousin is understandable I just want the poison I won't kill him, Thor replied. All right. Let me talk to him then. Said Loki. Okay, said Thor. Time skip. One hour. Location. Midgard coast of Norway. POV. Third person. The three gods could be seen walking along the beach, with one of them carrying a small jar. Thanks for your help uncle. It pays in your debt back, said Thor. And then Thor looked at Odin smiling. Odin was soon nervous but he still asked. Glup what do you want me to do? Asked Odin. Um I think I already have an idea as you know dad, I'm quite strong strong enough to keep certain things in line, like a pet, Thor began, smiling. For some reason Loki was worried. A pet. I don't see why not. What do you have in mind? A cat? A bird? Asked Odin. It was then that Thor's smile widened, and then he responded to Odin. I was thinking more about a wolf time skip. One week. Location. Midgard Underground, Midgard, Nadavalar. POV third person. A person walks slowly through an underground cave of Midgard, Midgard, known as Nadavalar. That person was Loki. Who was he looking for? The renegade dwarf from the kingdom of Nadavalar, responsible for forging one of the most feared swords in the Norse pantheon, the famous Stainsleaf. Loki walked through the darkness until he reached an area on the edge of the Nadavalar realm, and began to hear the sounds of a hammer. Loki, knowing he had found who he was looking for he just smiled. A short time later, a dwarf could be seen working until he stopped working and looked towards the shadows. What you want? Asked the dwarf. And then from the shadows Loki appeared. Hello Dane you are a very hard dwarf to find I came here to offer your chance for redemption, said Loki with a smile. You speak about redemption what do you have in mind? Asked the dwarf, now called Dane. Loki then started talking. Well what's the biggest redemption for a dwarf? Make the impossible possible, right? That's your code said Loki. I don't deserve to live by such a code not anymore explained Dane, sighing in sadness. Are you sure about that? Asked Loki. Loki then proceeded to walk around Dane's makeshift forge. Looks like you still live by this code, even if you say such words of regret, Loki said, pointing to some swords and armor in a corner. I'm still a dwarf I'm not forging for redemption I'm forging because it's in my blood, I forge to not forget who I am, and where I came from replied Dane, narrowing his eyes towards Loki. Oh. I see but have you thought about going home? To your dwarf brothers? Asked Loki curiously. The question seemed to get a reaction from Dane. Every day reply Dane softly, looking at the ground. So here's your opportunity if you forge two unique items I will convince Odin to talk to Reedmer, your leader, to accept you again, said Loki with a smile. This seemed to have caught Dane's attention. But he was still hesitating. 
My exile doesn't have many resources only the basics like gold, silver, and obsidian, said Dane. But then, Loki held out his hand, and it was then that Dane noticed a small vial of bright golden liquid something he had never seen before. What is it? Asked Dane, mesmerized. Loki then placed the vial in Dane's hands as he said. The tears of sorrow of a particular goddess everything it touches, if not alive, will turn to gold, but if it touches something alive? Not even I know what will happen. I will provide you with the resources, and you will forge two items for me said Loki. But still, Dane was curious about the tears, how did you get such an item? Asked Dane curiously. Hmm. Let's just say a playful squirrel owed me a favor he collected the tears quickly while the goddess was sleeping, explained Loki, smiling. But then Loki stopped smiling and stared at Dane. So do we have a deal? Asked Loki, extending his hand to Dane. Yes, Dane replied, reaching out and squeezing Loki's hand. Excellent, said Loki smiling again. Location. Niflheim. POV. Thor. Convincing Odin to give in for Fenrir's freedom wasn't easy after all, I would practically be releasing the God Slayer, and that made Odin's paranoia to be at the limit. But after showing Odin what I could do with my strength, as well as runes he gave up and authorized me to take care of Fenrir, but I would be responsible for whatever Fenrir did. My uncle Loki obviously, didn't like that I wanted his older son as a kind of mask it I won't lie, the situation was really weird, by logic Fenrir would be my cousin, but for some reason, according to Odin and Loki, Fenrir could not think like Jormungandr this means that Fenrir was driven by the old animal instinct. In short, Fenrir could differentiate. Friend from non-friend, just like a dog with a slight difference. The non-friend can become potential food very quickly. To be honest, many gods can start calling me crazy for wanting to tame something that can kill you with a single bite. However, I was really thinking long term the advantages of having Fenrir as a guard dog were many. The problem would be convincing Fenrir since he was imprisoned by those he once called family according to Odin, he thought that if they treated Fenrir with love and affection, he would grow up docile, but one thing Odin didn't count on was Fenrir's rate of growth. According to Odin, Fenrir can now devour a god mounted on a horse in a single bite, and this was getting too dangerous. So even though Fenrir has proven docile the gods decided to imprison him because of fear. It is a pity, but fear can blind even the wisest of men. Currently, I am confident that I can subdue him with my strength, but that will not grow the bond of trust I intend to have with Fenrir. My fishing adventure was with a simple objective. To find one of the only items capable to destroy Gleipnir. Jormungandr's poison. But the poison was too useful and unique to be wasted as mere chain-breaking acid, so I took a large amount, nearly 10 liters. May I know what you're weighing? Said a voice. I looked towards my traveling companion. Sif. It's nothing just thinking about how to proceed when I find Fenrir I explained. She just nodded in understanding. Why was Sif following me? Well. I didn't see any island called Lingvi on my last visit to Niflheim. Even though I went to the famous lake of the dead called Amsvartner, I didn't see any islands in the middle of the lake or even a bridge, Sif said she had found by accident the rune that caused a bridge to appear in the lake. Unfortunately, Sif wasn't very precise with her description of where she found this rune, so I asked her to accompany me. Basically, Sif would be my guide on this journey. She would only accompany me to the bridge, the rest was off limits as it was forbidden for her. I think we are already approaching the river Gjol, Gjol, Sif said. Yes I can already hear the screams of the souls. Is she still there? I asked Sif with a sigh. Ugh it almost certainly she does after all, she can't leave the bridge for too long, replied Sif. Sigh I just wish the personification of fury wouldn't have to get stuck in the river of turbulence I said regretfully. You can say that again said Sif. When we approach the famous river of reincarnation, or river of turbulence, called Jol, Jol, we could see the bridge that crossed the river, that divided the lands of the living from the lands of the dead, the bridge was called Jarlarbru, and had as a guard at Jodan, who was the personification of fury, called Majid or Majid. Stop right there. No living will cross the bridge of the dead without my permission. Shouted a voice. We looked towards the voice and we saw a fully armed warrior. The personification of fury, and the only guard of Jarlarbru Majid or Majid. 
Majid R. Majid, it's been a while I said with a nervous smile. She seemed to recognize me from my last visit. You. Do you know the problems you caused? Because of you, Nidhagra came out of his lair in Nastrand earlier and made a big mess. She yelled pointing at me. In my defense, it's hard to find a Draugr when it's an appetizer of Niflheim's dragon snake. Thor what did you do? Whispered Sif in my direction. I think you already know, but it's quite difficult to find a Draugr far from Nastrand without Nidhagr having devoured it. For every 1000 Draugr that appear in Nastrand, only one manages to get out of there and wander in the forest of the dead, so I thought it best to go straight to the source, but it looks like Nidhagr thought I was just another Draugr, let's just say I made him have a toothache he'll never forget, I explained whispering to Sif. What do you want now Isir? Asked Majid R, Majid, rudely. We'd like to cross, I didn't even get a chance to finish as I was interrupted by the angry Majid R. No. I won't allow you to cross Jarlarbru. You're just going to cause more trouble again. Said Majidr. Sigh alright while I find your anger at me understandable. I really need to cross this bridge so what do you want for allowing us to cross Jarlarbru? I asked. I really didn't want to cause too much trouble. She's just trying to do her job. I offered something because Majidr, as much as she was the personification of fury, she was known to be very bipolar on the one hand. She was quite easy to annoy, on the other hand, she was hmm, maybe there's something you can do what's your profession? Said Majidr, in consideration. She was quite calm when she wasn't angry in short she was a little crazy, and sometimes she said nonsense like now. My profession? I asked, unsure of how to respond. Yes I need an animal tamer right now you see, the water of Virgelmer is being defiled by two creatures get rid of them and I'll let you through whenever you like," explained Majidr. Strange. As far as I know, Nidhagr is the only thing that dips into Virgelmer, aiming to gnaw on one of the three roots of Yggdrasil, and the only root that extends to Niflheim. Nidhagr feeds on life from the root of Yggdrasil and death from the bodies of Draugr. You said, two creatures what are they? And how has Nidhagr not killed them yet? I asked. Unfortunately, the two creatures are faster than Nidhagr. And when they start to run, the sound of drums resounds in the sky, they started drinking Virgelmer's water some time ago, I just found out when Nidhagr once returned from Virgelmer extremely angry, so I went to investigate I was surprised to find those two things said Majidr, with a grimace of anger. You. Couldn't even capture them or kill them? Asked Sif in surprise. Majidr's grimace seemed to have worsened. I already told you those things are much faster than Nidhagr. In fact, Nidhagr didn't make any scratches on them when I went to investigate, I could only get their glimpse before they started running, explained Majidr. Have you seen them? Then what do these creatures look like? Asked Sif. Majidr seemed to be embarrassed. They are goats, replied Majidr. Time skip. 10 minutes. Location. Niflheim next to the boiling spring lake, Virgelmer. POV Thor. Being sent on a new mission isn't so bad because these two goats kind piqued my interest. After all not even Nidhagr can kill them due to their speed. Nidhagr might not be the fastest thing in the Nordic pantheon, but it was decently fast. And according to Majidr's description, it made me suspect that these two goats might be as fast as Free's ship, the Skidbladner. In the best case, I had a new study object in the worst case. I would have food for the rest of the trip. My train of thought was interrupted by my traveling companion. So any idea how we're going to capture or kill these two goats? Asked Sif. I waved. So I took out a necklace, which I created after I returned from my trip from Ethiopia, under my clothes. It was a simple storage necklace, due to being forged with simple materials, it has a small storage space compared to Frage's Brisingaman. Only 50 cubic meters. But it was enough for me to keep the same fishing line that caught Jormungandr. I have a plan I jump over them and tie them with this string simple and practical I replied. But Sif seemed to look at me in disbelief. Only that? No bait, or a descending rope? Or even a more elaborate plan? She asked in disbelief. If I were in someone else's body, obviously I would have a plan that would fit my situation. But I was in the body of a god who had trained in the art of brazenly plagiarizing the anime techniques I've watched. And one in particular it would result in my victory. 
He believe me Sif there's no need for further elaboration. Of that I guarantee I said smiling. That still didn't seem to convince Sif, but it would be easier to show her when the time came. When we got to Vergelmer we didn't see any sign of the creatures, so we waited. During this waiting time, Sif seemed to have gotten bored and tried to strike up a conversation. So I hear Princess Freja was quite happy when they found the Brisingaman in Utgard's quarters, said Sif. Yes but again, I was at that time looking for mead I wasn't looking for the necklace I explained with a bit of embarrassment. It wasn't a lie I found the necklace by accident. One of the few things I remember after my fight unilateral massacre at the castle of Utgard, I was looking for more mead, but I didn't find anything not a drop. My drunk self was obviously pissed off so pissed off as to demolish the west wing of the castle. The good thing about it? At least I was still smart enough to take some of the castle's ice blocks. The reason? I wanted to discover the secrets of the corrupted ice of the winter castle. I had to get more than a few stones of course, so the other day, after I got rid of the hangover and with free still in the healing chamber, I grabbed a chest, studded with runes of time and space, and took it to the castle rubble. A chest, with a capacity of 1000 cubic meters, filled with corrupted ice. After I returned from my trip to Africa with Free, I went to study more about the corrupted ice. There were things I discovered, like the ice in the castle it was different from the ice in Jotunheim. In fact, the ice that was most similar to the castle ice was Niflheim's ice. While I would like to further investigate the origin of ice. My goal at that time was to find out how he nullified magic. Interestingly, there was an angel from the Ubig G Pantheon, who did something similar anyway, after taking notes and finding out a little bit about how it works. I created a small prototype ring. Which, in theory, could nullify magic divine energy. I chose to forge a ring as it would be cheaper to make, and would save corrupted ice. Before I had any more ideas about the corrupted ice, Sif asked me another question. Thorham what do you think about Freja? Asked Sif, curious. Huh? What exactly do you want me to answer? I asked uncertainly. In a way, I was a little curious. Well, Sif has never been so expressive in these types of situations, and never showed such interest in talking about this kind of thing. Ah you know all men seem to want to court her at the latest parties, they always comment about her beauty. I was just curious about if everyone thinks the same thing about her asked Sif uncertainly. So. Does this mean that Sif is feeling insecure compared to the Freja beauty? Well I don't know about all the gods but I don't think the same way of them I tried to answer. That seemed to interest her really ahem so not all men think about the same beautiful woman? Asked Sif, curious. This conversation is taking a turn I don't approve of. Look. Not all men think about the same woman we're just interested in certain characteristics that some women have that catch our attention, while we can say that a woman is beautiful, it doesn't mean all men will drop everything to seek her affection, I tried to answer as best I could. Of course, there are certain exceptions. For some men, if a woman has big tits, it was enough to ask her to get married, I didn't forget about USA. I will burn you in the holy fire. So out of curiosity Thor what are the characteristics that you before I could hear Sif's question, we were interrupted by the clatter of drums or more accurately, hooves. We looked at the sky, and then we saw our targets. I could only smile. I've waited 50 years for this moment I whispered. Time skip. 5 minutes. POV Thor. On the shores of Lake Vergelmer, two goats found themselves drinking from the water. These two goats took turns to drink, while one drank water, the other was attentive to his surroundings. That's why Sif and I were still watching from a distance. So what now? They'll start running if we get too close asked Sif whispering to me. Stay here and don't blink for one second or you'll miss it, I replied, smiling. What do you mean? Asked Sif confused. However, I didn't respond and just started running towards the goats. I soon activated the rate no yori from the rakage to increase my speed, but it didn't seem to be enough. No problem then. To think that I would finally use this movement just 50 years after learning it the goat that wasn't drinking the water, seemed to have spotted me approaching quickly and warned its mate. Their hooves soon glowed blue and they looked ready to run. But I never would let that happen. For my next technique I must scream the name or else it will lose the magic. 
I quickly accumulated my divine power of lightning nature into a single spot on my forehead, this spot has the size of the tip of a needle. And as soon as I accumulated enough I released it in an explosion. Beware Zawarudo. I screamed. POV. Third person. For Sif, everything happened very fast first, she saw Thor begin to run at high speed towards the goats. Soon an aura of lightning resembling armor formed around Thor, and boosted Thor's speed to the point of disappearing from Sif's sight. Then Sif looked towards the goats, and as soon as she realized they were ready to run, she quickly tried to warn Thor. But then a blue-colored glow blinded Sif and the next thing she saw when she opened her eyes. It was Thor on the banks of Virgelmer with the two goats tied by their feet. Sif soon got up and ran towards Thor. As soon as she approached, she soon asked. By Odin. What was that? Asked Sif in disbelief. Thor just looked in her direction and smiled. Let's just say I may be known as a minor god of time Thor replied. A minor god of time? Asked Sif in surprise. Only for consideration Sif not really, said Thor. That still doesn't explain what you did muttered Sif. Sif then looked at the two goats. So what are we going to do with them? Asked Sif, curious. You know I'm a little hungry, and since I only need one to study it, we can kill the other one and eat it, Thor said with a shrug. Sif then faced Thor impassively. Study them? How are you going to do that? Asked Sif. Ah uh, you know simple things like knowing the maximum speed, where they get that energy to fly in the sky, maybe I need to open it to find out, said Thor, reflecting. For some reason as Sif and Thor talked, the goat seemed more agitated, it even seemed that they understood the conversation. This Sif quickly noticed. Can they? Understand us? Asked Sif uncertainly. The goats began to wave quickly. Thor, surprised by the goats' response, spoke. Interesting let's keep it simple, one nod for yes and two for no got it? Thor asked. The goats waved once. And don't think about lying, said Thor, taking a small stone from his necklace. The stone looked like a diamond. If someone malicious intent through deception, this stone will glow red. If one of you lies I'll kill you right here am I clear? Thor asked, his tone menacing. The goats waved quickly, afraid. However no one knows that Thor was lying, it was just an ordinary diamond stone that was left in the necklace storage. Let's start with something simple. Did you come to drink for Jelmer's water on purpose? Thor asked. The goats waved once. Did you have another place to drink? Thor asked. The goats waved once. Did you did you know that Nidhagr sometimes comes here to feed on the Yggdrasil root that is at the bottom of this lake? Thor asked uncertainly. The goats hesitated to respond but they nodded once. This confused Thor. They knew that Nidhagr was coming here, and they said they had other sources of water to drink, are you afraid of Nidhagr? Thor asked. The goats waved once. This, for Thor, would rule out the theory that they are not afraid of Nidhagr, due to the superior speed of goats relative to Nidhagr. But then Thor was wondering why the goats decided to drink from here. It was then that Thor looked at the water of Virgelmer. Do you find this water more tasty? Thor asked uncertainly. Incredibly the goats waved once. Are you kidding? They risked their lives for water that tastes better? Asked Sif in disbelief. It was then that Thor thought of the Yggdrasil root at the bottom of the lake. It's probably due to Yggdrasil. Look at Nidhogr, for example, he leaves the land of the dead to feed on the root every day. Perhaps the root, being a little bit gnawed due to Nidhogr, may have altered the taste of the Virgelmer water and made it more addictive for those who drink it. Thor explained uncertainly. Even Thor wasn't sure what he said. Anyway now that we're done here, we can continue with our journey. But what are you going to do with them Thor? Asked Sif, looking at the goats. The goats look nervous. Honestly, they are too intriguing to be mere food so I'm going to adopt them, Thor said, smiling. Sif looked unsure. Are you sure? You weren't planning on adopting Fenrir as a pet? Are you sure it's a good idea for a wolf and two goats to live on the same roof? Asked Sif. No, I won't let them live under the same roof Thor replied. So Thor pulled out two collars from his storage collar. I'm glad I brought spare parts said Thor. Sif was then curious. What are those? Asked Sif. Thor then put the collars on the goats that were tethered. These are two of the first versions I made for Fenrir's collar, 
but they were a failure because they didn't have the effect I originally wanted, so I kept them in my necklace in case of emergency, Thor explained. What effect did you want them to have? Asked Sif. Thor then smiled when he answered. User shrinkage replied Thor. Sif then understood. After all Fenrir, according to some sources, was already bigger than a house. But then what do they do? Asked Sif looking at the collars now on the goat's necks. Thor just smiled as he untied the goats. There's only one function you better see for yourself, Thor said. As soon as Thor untied the goats they soon shot into the sky and began to run quickly out of sight. Thor didn't even look altered when he held the necklace. X, Jibo, Thor whispered into the necklace. The necklace then glowed a little and created a magic circle in front of Thor from where the goats came again. What? Said Sif in surprise. The goat seemed to have been surprised to see the two humans again. It was then that Thor's smile grew before he began to explain. These collars are connected to this necklace of mine with a convergence rune, and with the aid of a time and space rune, I can call them to my side whenever I want or be fooled by them, yet they'll be free, but when I call they'll be by my side if I need it. And this necklace of mine is the key to remove the collars, so there's no danger if someone tries to remove the collars, I won't treat them like slaves, but they are very useful to pass up, that's why I'll leave them free if any of them are in danger, they will be transported to me immediately, explained Thor. Thor then looked at the goats who were staring at him in fear. Maybe one day I will call them partners too, Thor said, smiling. Time skip. 30 minutes. Location. Niflheim. POV Thor. After I adopted the goats and instructed them not to return to Virgelmer, Sif and I headed towards Majidr to finally cross Jarlarbru. When we crossed, it was noticeable that we were now in the land of the dead. How did we know? Well, Niflheim was known as the land of ice, home of Ymir while he lived, and, most importantly, it was still considered the realm of the living however, when one crosses Jarlarbru, the landscape changes. The phrase, leave all hope, ye who enter, never made so much sense in this situation. The realm of the dead is a place destined for all souls who have failed to go to the Valhalla Hall of the Aesir or the Sisrumner Hall of the Vanir Gods. Souls remain in the River Gjol, with some having the right to reincarnate to prove themselves worthy of going to the Feast Halls of the Gods. Souls that are not reincarnated remain in the river until they are Svartner, where they will remain there until they are transformed and draw Gran Arise on the coast of Svartner, named Nastrand. Mist covers the entire realm, teleport runes, and Odin's vision are interfered with by this mist rising from Svartner. Flying through runes was also useless, because according to Sif, once you started flying the mist would transport you to Jarlarbru again. An interesting fact about the Land of the Dead? It's quite different from Hell mentioned in the Bible, in fact, it's more of a cold land. And when I say cold, I'm not referring to Niflheim's cold it's much worse. It even seems to freeze your soul. Anyway, when Sif and I finally arrived in Amsvartner, we began to search the entire coast, as Sif described it, for a rune carved into the ground. It took a while but we finally found it. And just in time actually, Sif was afraid Nidhagr would show up. As soon as we activated the rune, a part of the Lake Amsvartner froze and a kind of bridge formed. Once again I'm going to ask you are you sure about this Thor? Asked Sif looking at me. I smiled. More than ever I don't know if there will be another rune in Lingvi to form this bridge. So I'll go ahead to check, if there is another rune, I already thank you for your company, and you can go back to Valhalla. But if there is no rune, then you will have to wait as you can't stay in Nastrand either, as it is Nidhagr's dining table so I'll be as quick as possible and try to be brief with Fenrir, I think about 5 minutes will be enough I said. Sif just nodded. I then activated the rate no Yoroi, and quickly ran across the bridge until I saw the island. As I was reaching the end of the ice bridge I realized there was something at the end. Was it a dog? Definitely not Fenrir. I slowed down and then deactivated the armor it looked like he noticed me now. And began to growl. GRR, very well then. Hostile attitude deserves a hostile response I said, narrowing my eyes. The creature leaped towards me. I responded by removing the Mjolnir from my belt and tapping his jaw while he was airborne. The result was that his head exploded in ice? And it looked like the lifeless body was growing a new head. 
Does this thing regenerate? I don't exactly have a lot of time for this, I said. I then activated the lightning armor again, and scanned the coast of the island of Lingvi. I found the other rune it was inside a cave, which appeared to be the creature's home. Not bad then. I then returned towards Sif, she was still on top of the rune. As soon as I appeared, she looked at me in surprise. You've returned already? So there's a rune on the other side? Asked Sif. I nodded. Yes I can handle this now, alone. But first, can you get off the rune? I asked. It couldn't be that easy, otherwise, Fenrir wouldn't need to be trapped on an island. Sif then got off the rune. When I looked towards the bridge, I started to count I didn't get past two seconds. The bridge began to melt and became the black water of Lake Amsvardner again. So it had a time. Well that was insightful, when I discovered the bridge I ran towards my team, but when I got back it was gone we weren't lucky to double check, as Nidhagra chose to wake up at that time he said. Sif. By the way what were you doing so close to Nastrand? I asked curiously. Nastrand is not a forbidden place like Lingvi. But it was still the place where Nidhagra fed on the Draugr that came up from the lake, so there was a consensus that it was a relatively dangerous place. We were on a mission actually a dwarf named Anvari, entrusted us with a very important mission, the mission was to capture a Draugr replied Sif. Anvari? Capture a Draugr? That doesn't make sense. Draugr, rare as they are, there aren't many things they can offer, one of those things is your blood, and yet not all Draugr have blood, only the freshest who have just left Nastrand, have a small amount of blood, the longer a Draugr spends wandering in the forest of the dead, the less chance of getting blood from it. But why did Invari want to capture Draugr? Sif out of curiosity. Did your group receive any more information on this mission? I asked. You know how we work Thor, no questions, just the mission although I was also curious, as I've never seen this type of mission explained Sif, who then began to reflect. I really don't know if I should get involved, but it's better to ask Odin about it. But right now, I have other priorities. Thanks to my speed, I'm more than able to cross the bridge without needing any help, so I thank you for your help Sif I said, nodding. Sif just replied. No need to say thanks, after all, we are friends it's been a long time, so it's not like it's a big deal to help each other, said Sif, smiling, before saying goodbye and starting to walk towards the forest path that led to Jarlarbru. She was right. Of all the people I've met, Sif is my oldest friend, as well as the closest. After all, I was never close to others, even my brothers. The reason? They were idiots when they were younger, actually, they are still dumb even Vider. In fact, Vider only became more aware of his actions when he fought me. How did this happen? Well. When I was in my 30s, I had just fought Sif, and he thought it would be fun to do the same thing. A month later I was in my room when suddenly my mother Frigg appeared and told me that Sif was in serious condition in the healing chamber. I was surprised and asked what had happened her answer? Vider had forced Sif to fight and played with her during the match until Sif landed a right hook to Vider's face, and he retaliated. Frigg had informed me, as she knew that Sif was a good friend of mine. I asked how she knew about Sif's fight against Vider, and her answer made me a little disappointed about my brother, it was because Vider had returned bragging that he had won and told everyone that he was as strong as I was. I didn't believe it. After all, it was a ridiculous answer. As soon as I got out of bed to go over to Vider and ask his version, my mother spoke the following words to me. I know you're going to ask Vider you may be the youngest, but you're more mature and responsible than your older brothers, I beg you then if I am telling the truth, please don't overdo it, that was what she said. I just agreed and had left for Vider. I found him in Valhalla, drinking and mocking the fight, saying how pathetic the most promising Einarjar of the future generation was. It was at this point that I knew Frigg had spoken the truth. Another thing Frigg said was also true, was that I acted like the responsible older brother, even though I was younger than Hermod, Vali, and Vider. I then accepted this big brother role, and as a good big brother teaching the younger brother, there is a saying. Never let the little shit get too confident. I challenged Vider to a fight, he was drunk when he accepted the challenge according to Tur, who trained the three eldest princes, Vider never again mocked his defeated opponents, and came to respect them. 
I suppose a good spanking and 15 days confined in a healing chamber did well for his personality anyway. When I got back to my thoughts, I soon headed towards the rune to activate the ice bridge. As soon as it started to form, I activated the lightning armor and stopped time. Crossing the bridge was very simple at this speed. It was only when I got to the other side that I deactivated the Raten no Yoroi, and the effect of Zawarudo was gone. And it looked like the dog-like creature had completely regenerated, and when it saw me it started to run away. Well I suppose that makes things easier, I said, shrugging. I soon started walking along a small path. As I walked, I started having thoughts. Not so necessary. Whom should I give Fenrir a new nickname? Dot 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 sparky dot 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 fluffy dot 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 rupee dot 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 hmm so many options but I think it would be better to cross over that bridge, only when I reach it I said in finality. After a while of walking, in the distance, I could see a kind of castle. A castle a little too dark for my taste. Definitely, Fenrir wasn't there. But if people are living here then they probably know where Fenrir is chained. So I headed towards the castle. And as soon as I approached stop. Who are you? And what is your purpose in Iljudner? Shouted a voice nearby. Slap, idiot. Don't treat our lady's possible guests like that. Shouted another voice. I turned towards the voices and saw a man and a woman. Who was walking slowly towards me. A baby crawling across the floor was faster than these two. Sigh look, I don't want to disturb so I'll be short and straight do you know where Fenrir is? I asked. This seemed to surprise the man. Fenrir the god slayer the wolf of the end, the first beast of Ragnarok, the older brother of the queen of the underworld. Asked the surprised man, it looked like he was hyperventilated. I nodded quickly. Yes. So do you know where he is? I asked quickly, the faster I find Fenrir the faster I get out of here. Nope replied the poker-faced man. This dude I ran towards him, which seemed to surprise him, and then I grabbed him by the collar and lifted him off the ground. Are you kidding? I asked, and started shaking him. The woman then tried to grab my arm to make me let go of the man. Please stop. We really don't know. We just know who he is. We don't know where he is. But we know of someone who does. Tried to explain the woman quickly. That last statement was helpful. I lowered the man and put him down again, but I didn't let go. Who are you talking about? I asked, narrowing my eyes. Our lady replied the woman. And who is your lady? I asked suspiciously. The queen of the underworld hell replied the woman. Well looks like Loki's daughter has been busy these years location. Niflheim Jodner, Castle Hall of Hell, POV Thor. I will not lie, I have never seen my cows in hell in all my 100 years of life. After all, I only learned of her existence after my bloodthirsty adventure in Jodenheim. So seeing that she was already being revered as Queen of the Underworld was a little worrying? I don't know if this is the best definition. As soon as I entered the palace I followed the instructions of the man and woman from before, who introduced themselves as Gangloti and Ganglet respectively, and found myself in a kind of throne room. The throne, for some reason, looked more like a bed? I think Ganglet referred to Hell's throne as core. And I could see that someone was lying lazily on the bed, and it seemed to be sleeping. What a laziest reception cough I coughed, intending to clear my throat and wake the person sleeping in the bed throne. The person lying down seemed to have woken up, as soon she got up and looked in my direction, I assume she's Hell, but is it too much of a coincidence that she looks like her younger version of Marvel? Without the ridiculous helmet of course. Ah. A visitor. She exclaimed. She then snapped her fingers, and the throne room seemed to respond to her command, as a green flame emerged from the torches and chandeliers in the hallway, her bed seemed to change into a kind of throne worthy of royalty, greetings visitor. I'm hell. As much as I want to welcome you into my house by the law of the guest, were you not accompanied by one of my servants? Hell asked, confused. Ah if it's the man and woman outside I left them there and asked for directions, because they were walking too much slowly? I replied uncertainly. It wasn't a lie, a baby crawling was faster than those two ah, these two said hell, putting both hands to her face and wailing. Seeing her mourn is kind of disappointing? I honestly expected more from the queen of the underworld. Ah excuse me, I stopped how am I supposed to reference her? Queen? No, 
she is not my queen cousin? Well she is the daughter of a prince, as Loki is Odin's brother by a blood oath, and not by birth, so would that be wrong? My thoughts were interrupted by Hell. Only Hell is fine so, could you please introduce yourself? I don't get many visitors at least not visitors who are still breathing, Hell said, muttering the last part. Well this queen of the underworld is proving more reasonable than I thought she would be. My name is Thor, son of Odin, and I'm on a quest I replied. I don't know if I can say that I'm looking to reduce her brother, the god slayer himself, to a guard dog um son of Odin? So you're my cousin? Said Hell in happiness? Air kind of yes? I guess I said, shrugging. When I confirmed that I was her cousin, Hell stood up from the throne quickly and ran towards me. I won't deny it, I was on alert quickly, I was ready to drum Jolner if necessary to defend me. But what happened next was weird. The reason? Hell, the queen of the underworld, and princess of Asgard by blood oath hugged me. I'm so glad someone from the family came to visit me. Said Hell, hugging me. Huh? Don't you get many visits from our family? I asked. When she heard my question, Hell stopped hugging me and stepped back a bit, and began rubbing her left arm. Well not exactly. You see when I was a child I always had the company of my older brothers, but one day Odin came to us with open arms to welcome us in Asgard, but one day Jormungandr was sent to Midgard by Odin, I don't know what they did to him, but he never came back. According to my father, he was growing too much and too fast. After that, for a while it was just me and my brother Fenrir until my powers manifested, and, because of my affinity, Odin sent me to here, explained Hel. I got it for some reason these answers were reeking of prophecy paranoia. Hel then continued to speak. Of course I was lonely for a while but I had visits from my father and Fenrir, accompanied by an Aesir named Tur, so it was tolerable? But that changed when I got the news from my father that Fenrir killed Mimir, a great advisor of Odin, in a fit of rage. Fenrir was then chained and sent here, so that I could keep an eye on him one day I went to visit him, but as I approached. He tried to attack me, said Hell, looking at the landscape out through a window. So they didn't tell the whole truth to her typical. I knew Fenrir was arrested because the gods feared him Tur and Loki were the only ones who opposed the arrest. But Tur is too loyal to Odin, and he soon gave up trying to convince him to stop Fenrir's arrest. Loki was more persistent, according to my mother Frigg. But he was soon silent when Odin compared Fenrir to a wild dog capable of killing gods without control. The ironic thing is that, like me, Fenrir was tricked by Odin and his father. The first two attempts to arrest Fenrir? Odin and Loki tricked him by convincing him that breaking chains was a way of showing his strength. Due to Fenrir's mind being a bit primitive he fell into the conversation perfectly. And then came the turn of the third chain called Gleipnir according to Frigg, who was watching, when Fenrir realized he could not break the chain, he soon began to cry for help, but the gods ignored the crying, and celebrated the victory over the beast of Ragnarok and the god slayer. When I asked her about Fenrir, he told me that Fenrir no longer trusted the god so much after Dromi's attempt, that he managed to break down into an excess of rage, and accidentally kill Mimir. So, to convince Fenrir, he offered to put his hand inside Fenrir's mouth. Fenrir believed as Tur was considered his longtime pack friend, and he thought Tur would never betray him. Big mistake Fenrir. Big mistake but I give you a discount on account of your rather primitive mind. Hell soon pulled me out of my thoughts. Anyway, you said you were on a quest may I ask what kind of a quest would this be? Asked Hell, curious. What should I say? Should I lie? Should I tell half-truths? But again, the truth is more valuable for a first impression. And being on the good side of the future goddess of death, can be advantageous for plans, because I was also interested in knowing about my destiny in this world, and if I changed anything due to my birth. And if there is one person who knew about the location of the Agents of Destiny of the Norse Pantheon, it is the Goddess of Death. After all, fate goes hand in hand with death. After some consideration I made my decision. I won't lie I know Fenrir is trapped here in Lingvi, I came to you to find out his location and in a way release him, I explained. Initially, Hell received the news in happiness, as it meant her older brother's freedom, but when I said the last part, Hell seemed to eye me suspiciously. What do you mean by in a way? Hell asked suspiciously. 
Here comes the truth. It won't exactly be free it will be more like a semi-open regime I explained. Hell looked confused. What is semi-open regime? Asked Hell. Ah oh, fuck I forgot I'm out of my time. Simply put he will be transferred to another location, which will be my home in Midgard, he will be watched by me and on my terms. It may just seem like a prison change to you, but I guarantee he will have more freedom than what is being offered here in Lingvi I explained. Ada knows this? Hell asked uncertainly. Yes, he was the one who allowed me to actually do that don't worry, I can take care of Fenrir in peace I said confidently. Very well then. Fenrir has been arrested in the valley closest to the north of here, perhaps two hours walk said Hell. Okay this was simpler than I thought. Well thank you cousin I'll leave immediately, I said turning my back to leave the room. Hang on. Shouted Hell. I turned and looked at Hell, who looked sad. Are, are you leaving already? Do you want to stay a little longer? Perhaps for the feast? I have the best cooks because, well they died and came here anyway, you must be hungry. Would you like to stay for the feast? Asked Hell excitedly. She looked like someone who's only known solitude for a long time, and who craves company. But I was in the middle of a personal quest. Look I'd like to stay but I'm pretty busy, and my time is short so I started to explain. But as soon as I said those words, it felt like the excitement she'd had before disappeared, when I bring Fenrir to Midgard feel free to visit us I said. I couldn't be upset with her she just wanted company from people who were alive as well as seeing her family again. Maybe I'll catch Jormungandr again, so Hell says hello to her long lost brother. Midgard? Would I have to leave here? I I don't know at all was said no one can hurt me while I'm in the land of the dead, explained Hell. She looked scared. But what was she afraid of? Of disobeying her father? Or fear of leaving her comfort zone? I guarantee it won't be a big deal, it's always good to have a change of scenery wait a minute I said. I then took from my necklace a piece of parchment with a custom teleport rune. Here, I said, handing Hell the piece of parchment. As soon as she took it, I started to explain. As you can see, this might look like an ordinary teleport rune. But it will take you to a small wood in Midgard, follow the path, and you will find my home, when you come out of the land of the dead, put the rune in the palm of your hand, and then drop the piece of parchment on the ground to embed the rune and the rune in the palm of your hand, will serve as a key to the ground rune, so don't worry. Come visit your brother Fenrir later, maybe Jormungandr does show up either, I said, shrugging. Hel smiled and held out her hand. Thank you cousin said Hel, taking the piece of parchment. Well I have a clear conscience now it's time to adopt the ultimate pet. I think that's it remember cousin, you are always welcome at my house. And this isn't goodbye it's just see you later I said, smiling. I then walked towards the exit. Before leaving Hell's throne room, I even heard a voice muttering, yes see you later think I did a good deed? Well it doesn't really matter. It's not like Santa Claus is real and gives me a present right? After all, the Christmas celebration doesn't even exist. Hum. Maybe I should create a kind of celebration since there is no Christmas? Anyway, I stopped thinking about these things after all, they weren't important at the time. I then activated the lightning armor, and ran towards Fenrir's location, it only took a few seconds to reach the valley. And there he was and it looked like he had noticed me because he was looking at me and growling. Well I'm not surprised by this hostile attitude on Fenrir's part. After all, he was betrayed by the people he trusted most. Betrayal hurts because it never comes from our enemies, but from the people Thar we most consider and love. It was time to extend the hand of friendship and not lose it as Tur did. Hello cows and beautiful day in the underworld don't you think? I asked smiling and approaching slowly. He just growled. That's maybe it will be more difficult than I thought location. Land of the Dead, formerly known as Helheim, Isle of Ligvi. POV Thor. Fenrir's behavior is what I thought it would be, so it's going to be difficult to establish some form of trust. Hell had already commented that Fenrir tried to attack her. So does this mean that Fenrir didn't recognize her? Or does Fenrir no longer trust anyone? Come to think of it, he is far more likely to trust no one but himself. So we have the lone wolf, huh? GRRRRR the closer I got, the more Fenrir became agitated easy boy, it's not like I'm going to hurt you senseless, I said calmly, as I slowly approached Fenrir. It looked like Fenrir had calmed down? 
When I got close enough I was wrong to assume that Fenrir had calmed down, as he soon shot his head with open jaws in my direction. POV third person. As soon as Fenrir realized that Thor was within reach, he soon roared and shot his head quickly towards Thor, intending to kill him with a single bite. And then when Fenrir closed his mouth, he realized that he couldn't close it. You know I knew I should have waited longer for you to act more reasonably, after all, you didn't even trust your sister, there was no need to pretend to be docile and try to kill me, said a voice in the mouth of Fenrir. It was Thor, who was holding Fenrir's jaws by the fangs and preventing him from closing his mouth. Fenrir then shook his head and flung Thor out of his mouth. Thor then landed some distance from Fenrir, and then looked at his stubborn cowson. Hum I see you still have a grudge against other people understandable, after all, some people tend to be disappointing, Thor explained. Fenrir growled in response and flailed further, trying to free himself from Gleipnir. Thor walked towards Fenrir and made a portal connected to his necklace's storage space, and took out a small package. Fenrir stopped growling immediately looked at the suspicious package, which gave off a smell of food. But Fenrir did not recognize the smell. It smelled good, but Fenrir had no idea what that smell was. Are we going to make a little deal boy? Thor asked calmly. But honestly he had no idea if Fenrir was understanding him, he could only assume that Fenrir's intelligence goes so far. Fenrir looked at Thor, still suspicious but curious about the food in Thor's hand. Thor then took a sort of yellow pill from the necklace, and then looked at it. I just hope it's enough, said Thor thoughtfully. What was the pill? Well Thor knew it was unfeasible to forge a giant collar, as Fenrir would never let him get close. So he established two steps. First create something to shrink Fenrir. Second shamelessly bribe the god-killing wolf with unbeatable human cuisine far beyond its present time. All right boy take it, Thor said, tossing the small package in the air towards Fenrir. Fenrir, due to being immortal he couldn't starve, but that doesn't mean he would deny free food after years in chains. Plus, whatever it was, it had a mouth-watering aroma. Fenrir then opened his mouth waiting for the small package to fall into his mouth. In Fenrir's desperation to get food, Thor took advantage of this and hurled the pill towards Fenrir's mouth, which as soon as he swallowed Thor whispered to his necklace a command word in the user. The acute algae's, Fenrir, said Thor. For Fenrir it seemed like the whole world was suddenly gigantic. Then Thor took the package he had used to distract Fenrir and knelt to take a closer look at Fenrir, you know I chose the R-U-N-E acute algae's as a command, as I think it would be quite symbolic for your case after all, thanks to my classes with my mother, I know this rune has a particular meaning. It means prosperity, self-love, benevolence, success, and everything that makes you feel light and strong to move on, but mostly, it symbolizes a great time to get away from everything that makes and lets you down, everything that saddens you. In a way, this rune will symbolize a new beginning for you, said Thor smiling at Fenrir. Fenrir snarled in response. But he didn't look so confident, for at this moment Thor was much bigger than he was. Hey, easy boy this time there won't be any tricks here, Thor said, opening the package and offering Fenrir the food inside. The food inside? Nothing beats Italian food. It was on this day that Fenrir met Arancini. Fenrir, while still alert, began to feed on the good-smelling food and slowly. He no longer cared that Thor was nearby. Thor then sat down next to Fenrir with care, and watched as the final wolf gorged himself on the offered food. POV Thor. I sat next to Fenrir as he greedily devoured Arancini Fenrir liking food was just a hunch of mine, as on account of being immortal and living in isolation, it's probably been a while since he's fed on normal food. He was imprisoned here to be forgotten. Just like the rest of his siblings Jormungandr? When Odin noticed that the snake kept growing at an accelerated pace, he decided the best solution, for him, would solve the problems the solution? Throwing Jormungandr into the sea of Midgard and hoping he's killed by something bigger is sometimes I think Odin isn't that wise. According to Tur, Jormungandr was the size of a giant snake of 50 feet long at the time Odin thought that if Jormungandr was thrown into the ocean of Midgard, Jormungandr would be killed in just a few weeks I shrunk Fenrir first, as I wanted Arancini to transform from a grain of rice to a stick with Fenrir. And it worked just as I planned. I stopped thinking when I noticed that Fenrir had stopped eating. 
When I looked inside the package, I noticed that Arancini was gone. Wine I looked towards Fenrir and saw him shift his gaze between me and Arancini's now empty package. I could only deny it. I I don't have more food? I tried to explain. But Fenrir didn't seem to believe it, as he continued to mourn. I just sighed but still gave a small smile. I'm telling you the truth I didn't expect you to want more, so let's get you more food, but first, we should sort out the important things I got up and opened my necklace's storage portal again, and I took two things. The first was a collar similar to the collars I used on the goats earlier, but this collar has a dual function. It will be the replacement for the pill that Fenrir devoured to shrink after all, the pill would dissolve a day later. The second thing was a small vial containing Jormungandr's poison. When Fenrir saw the collar in my hand, he quickly growled in suspicion. Well I suppose I should have been a little more discreet whoa, calm down boy I said, trying to calm him down. Unfortunately, I wasn't successful so I had a maybe a little silly idea. I wore the collar on my wrist, which was the only place it fit due to its size. See? It's okay I said calmly. Fenrir stopped growling, but he still looked suspicious. I removed the collar easily, thanks to having my necklace that was the key, and slowly walked over to Fenrir to put it on. All this time Fenrir eyed me suspiciously, but he never growled, so I took that as a good sign. And so, I put the collar on Fenrir. As soon as I finished putting on the collar, I took out the small vial of Jormungandr's poison, and poured it into Gleipnir carefully, as I really didn't want to spill the corrosive poison into Fenrir by accident, so I just held it in place. It felt like I was disarming a bomb, as Fenrir kept staring at me after some time and a few drops of Jormungandr's poison here and there Fenrir was completely loose I backed away slowly, not wanting to frighten him besides establishing a safe distance for me, after all, he still is the slayer of gods, even though it now fits in the palm of my hand. I didn't want to allow Fenrir to rip my throat right after being released. But it appears that my concerns were unfounded. Fenrir, after looking at the partially destroyed Gleipnir on the ground, he turned back to face me. If the looks were still suspicious, I had no idea, but I refused to take a step closer, as that was the moment when Fenrir was calmer. It was then that Fenrir took the first step towards me. He didn't run, he didn't jump for my throat, he just walked. Slowly but surely, the distance between us seemed to shrink as Fenrir approached. And when he was just an arm's length away he stopped. It looked like he was looking at me with expectation. So I made a decision and held out my right hand. Fenrir then jumped into my hand. For a brief second, I thought he was going to try to bite me again. But then I saw that he never opened his mouth. Fenrir now it was comfortably to my right. Well I started to say. Until I stop and think about my next words after a while I knew exactly what to say. You're my friend now we'll have Arancini when we get home I said smiling. It's going to take a while. But I really do see another future partner, in this little lone wolf. It was then that I heard a grunting noise, and looked at Fenrir. That was his stomach well, maybe I should feed him as soon as possible. It was then that I had an idea. Hey boy how about joining a family dinner with your little sister? I asked smiling at Fenrir. Fenrir just stared at me until he tilted his head. He looked confused. Well it's easier to show than explain I said in finality. The place I wanted to take Fenrir? The place with a lot of food, and a younger sister who misses her older brother. Hell's Palace. And then I walked towards my next destination, which was the Palace of Hell again. What was the name Gangladi referred to Hell's Palace itself? Hma. Oljudner, here we go. I said, smiling towards Fenrir. Maybe it's good for both Fenrir and Hell, this meeting of siblings after all. As much as Hell said that Fenrir tried to attack her, maybe it was because Fenrir still had a grudge in his heart, in fact, he still must have but with me watching, it will be a relatively safe reunion. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.